distracted in can thinking about the budget. Can you make that a norm? Mm -hmm. Good evening, can you Tom. Make sure that you barely bring us alcohol every year when you do the budget. That's very kind of you, Tom. You can line, very six, kind. You can line six of them up right there. <laughs> You. I haven't talked to you in a long time. I keep seeing you in passing ships in the night. Uh, you were quite the woman about town this weekend, I must say. Yes, you were. KRS One. Uh, SWV. That took me back. I bet it did. Really? <laughs> Is there a water in the cup? Good for you once in a while. Oh, Clean your ears out. Is this like? I drive a minivan. It's oil. It's ready. Now that I know about we trade? I want the cherry water with that. Rings, trade? I'm like super motivated to mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Tart. I like that. tier two. Oh, I'm like, we can't, yeah. <laughs> we can't get up to tier three. We're Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you. Two. I'm just chugging yeah, this as soon as someone says it's okay. Right. Go, going in. We should have a word. We should have a, we should have a contest. If you have a water, we should still have the word. Can we just like drink the, oh, it's on now. We're live. Hello. Alert. First, of course, concentrate with this much information in front of me. I have After to read. 10 years and all that. That's funny. <laughs> hey, listen, you won't hurt my feelings. As I've told many people, Tom, you won't hurt my feelings. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. One's not on. There we go. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Not sure what's going on with the mics. I'd like to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order for May the 21st, 2018. I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. We're glad to have you. Would you please join me for a moment of silent meditation? Thank you. Councilmember Reese, would you lead us in the pledge? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening to my colleagues. For those of you in the audience, this is the time when we, uh, if you're able and if it's your practice to do so, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. And Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll have our ceremonial items. Our first item tonight is a very exciting item, which is the Neighborhood Spotlight recipient for the month of May 2018, which will be presented to Marcella Jones of the J.J. Henderson Towers community. Could I ask Ms. Jones and members of her family who are, or friends who are here with her, I know her godmother is here with her, to please come forward. Any friends that you would like to bring? And her brother is also here as well. And I see Mr. Lyons is with us. 
Come on up. Let me hear Marcella. From right here. Marcella Jones is the recipient of the Neighborhood Spotlight for the month of May 2018. The Neighbor Spotlight Award recognizes community members that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve the community. This month, Marcella Jones, a resident of the J.J. Henderson Towers community, was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work she has done in her neighborhood, including, but not limited to, providing information materials to meet the needs of her neighbors at J.J. Henderson Towers, advocating for better services for Durham residents as the Durham Housing Authority Resident Council President, as a member of the Durham Housing Authority's Crime Task Force, and on the Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities. Building partnerships with city, county, and housing authority officials, church members, community leaders, local businesses, and nonprofit organizations to improve the quality of life for Durham residents. Congratulations, Ms. Jones, on being the May Neighbor Spotlight for the City of Durham, and thank you for all the work you do to improve our Durham community. We are so proud to present you with this award. And just I want to say, as a, as a longtime friend and admirer of yours, I'm especially, especially pleased to be presenting you with this Neighbor Spotlight Award and plaque uh, for May of 2018. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, everything that I do, have done, and will do is because I'm an advocate for any person with a disability and all seniors. We are seasoned seniors, and we are your future. Along with our children, I'd like to say hello to our liaison for the Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities. City Councilwoman, Gideon Friedman. Thank you. Thank you for your help. You still owe me a visit. I'll be there. It's in public now. <laughs> I'll be there soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. And congratulations to you all as well. Yes, of course. We'll have a quick picture. You go ahead, Mr. Mike. We'll get you in the picture, too. Thank you very much. All right. The next item is the Play Ball Summer Proclamation, which will be presented to Faith Inman. Ms. Inman here. Ms. Inman here. Well, I will read the proclamation. Uh, this is the Play Ball Summer Proclamation. Whereas the sport of baseball is America's national pastime, and whereas the United States Conference of Mayors, Major and Minor League Baseball have come together to recognize June to August as Play Ball Summer, and whereas Play Ball Summer encourages families and communities to participate in the game of baseball, thus creating sustainable enthusiasm for the game, and whereas cities across the country will be coming together during the summer to support the growth of baseball and softball, and whereas baseball and softball produce countless family and community bonding experiences, and whereas baseball and softball have taught our youth valuable life lessons of teamwork, perseverance, leadership, and sportsmanship, and whereas baseball and softball have formed a diverse culture, showcasing a snapshot of where America stands today, and whereas baseball and softball provide a proud sense of belonging to something bigger than oneself, Whereas we recognize the importance and influence of baseball and softball in the city of Durham. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim June through August 2018 as Play Ball Summer in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this 21st day of May 2018. And uh, I'm sorry that Ms. Inman's not here, but we will be presenting this uh, as well uh, to the Durham Bulls, and I look forward to that.
Our next presentation is for Gun Violence Awareness Day, and I'm going to ask Meredith Altieri and anyone that may be with her from Moms Demand Action or uh, other uh, folks that are, be, are here to receive this proclamation to please come forward. Are you good to see you? Hey, Keisha. Hey, how are you? Nice to meet you. Are you married? Yeah. All right. Thank you all very much for being here. I'm going to read the proclamation and present it to you, Ms. Altieri. <clears throat> and afterwards, uh, we'd love to hear a few words from you as well. Whereas every day, 96 Americans are killed by gun violence, and on average, there are nearly 13,000 gun homicides every year. And whereas Americans are 25 times more likely to be murdered with guns than people in other developed countries. And whereas, according to Durham Police Department statistics, 233 people were shot in Durham in 2017, an increase from the past two years. And whereas 27 people were killed by gun violence in Durham in 2017, and seven people have been killed by gun violence in Durham already in 2018, according to the Durham County Homicide Database. And whereas, in January 2013, Hydea Pendleton, a teenager who marched in President Obama's second inaugural parade and was tragically shot and killed just weeks later should now be celebrating her 21st birthday. And whereas to help honor Hadia, along with the victims of gun violence here in Durham as well as the 96 Americans whose lives are cut short and the countless survivors who are injured by shootings every day, a national coalition of organizations has designated June 1st, 2018, the first day in June, as the fourth National Gun Violence Awareness Day and whereas the idea was inspired by a group of Hadia's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange. And whereas by wearing orange on June, on June the 1st, 2018, Durham residents and Americans will raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of gun violence victims and survivors. And whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim June 1st, 2018 as Gun Violence Awareness Day in the City of Durham, and do hereby call upon all citizens to support our local community's efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this, the 21st day of May, 2018. Ms. Altieri. Thank Mayor Shule and our city council for being so supportive. Not all communities are as supportive, and we're very lucky here in Durham. This is an issue that reaches across race, religion, gender, ethnicity. Um, no one is immune to it, and it, it's something that I hope everyone will get behind and support. Uh, we recognize it nationally and locally. I think of uh, victims and survivors on this day, um, Hong Zheng a local Durham businessman who was killed recently by gun violence. I think of him. I think of just a year ago, young woman Daisy Medina, who was shot um, through her apartment building um, by unintentional gunfire. Um, and, and there are many other, both survivors and victims, that will remember. We'd like to invite everyone on the, <coughs> the city council and in the community to join us on Friday, June 1st, to wear orange in remembrance of people and in honor of survivors, and also to invite you all on Saturday, June 2nd, to our Wear Orange event at Hillside Park from 10 to 1 p.m. It will be a, a happy event to, again, honor victims and survivors and to have some fun um, while we try to do more to prevent gun violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you all so much. And this is very important work. I don't have to tell anybody in this room the critical importance of this, the future of our community. And I'm very, really, very appreciative of you all being here to do this. Thank you so much. And finally, uh, we will have no National Public Works Week. And I will ask Marvin Williams, our Director of Public Works, to please come forward. Marvin, I'm going to read this uh, proclamation and present it to you. 
Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure facilities and services, there are vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, high quality of life, and well-being of the people of the city of Durham. And whereas these infrastructure facilities and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees from state and local governments in the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, stormwater, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. And whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in the city of Durham to gain knowledge of and to maintain a progressive interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities. And whereas the American Public Works Association has celebrated the annual National Public Works Week since 1960, now therefore I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the week of May 21st to 27, 2018 as National Public Works Week in the City of Durham and urge all citizens to join with representatives of the American Public Works Association and government agencies in activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, and employees and to recognize the substantial contributions they make to protecting our national health, safety, and quality of life. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this, the 21st day of May, 2018. And I will present this to you, Marvin, uh, for any words that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Um, actually, there's several members of the Public Works Department in the audience today. I would ask that they stand to be recognized formally in public for all the great work that they do for the city. Of <laughs> so every year I always say that Public Works, we're the kind of department that you forget about if we're doing things right, and you only hear about us when someone feels we're not doing things to their satisfaction. Uh, but we do do a lot of good for the community on a daily basis, and I'm proud to say that all the staff in Public Works is great. Uh, we do a lot for Durham, and we try to keep the city moving on a daily basis. So we have several activities planned for this week. Um, today we actually had some activities with one of the elementary schools here in the city, and we're trying to get into another elementary school later in the week to talk to them about what Public Works is. Uh, tomorrow, we also have our backhoe challenge at our Public Works Operations Center pretty much all day. So any members of council, if your schedule will permit, you're more than welcome to come. I'll email this information to you later this evening just so that you have it. Um, we're also going to be delivering hygiene kits to Urban Ministries on Wednesday as part of our community service activity as a department. And we'll also be having a so-called fun day where we gather all employees of the department down at Southern Boundaries Park for lunch on Friday afternoon. So again, if anyone has availability, you're more than welcome to attend. But uh, I just wanna say thank you all for recognizing us as a department and for the work that we do, and we appreciate it. All right, that concludes our ceremonial items. I do want to say that the backhoe challenge sounds awesome. <laughs> and I uh, would love to get the email about that. I'm That's totally cool. there. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, and now we will have any announcements by members of the council. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Freeman. Right. Maybe a few moments. Um, just uh, one announcement. I just wanted to make sure that I congratulated the hillside track team, track and field team for winning their uh, 3A state women's, sorry, women. But yes, the, the Hillside women's track and field team for winning their state division, um, which was 3A. And then I also wanted to thank Parks and Rec for their wonderful work last week with the Bembe Festival. As we celebrated 49 years, I wanted to highlight that next year we'll be celebrating 150 years of our founding and 50 years of the Bembe Cultural Arts Festival, and I think it'll be a really big year. So I just want to put that on everyone's radar. And um, I lastly wanted to spend a little time talking about our shared prosperity goal area and recognizing, if you don't know, Black Enterprise um, is having an upcoming Entrepreneur Summit, which will be held uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, next month in June, June 6th through the 9th. 
And it gives me great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about um, the opportunity for our emerging entrepreneurs and small business owners in Durham and how they can start, grow, and sustain their businesses. Um, this being the 23rd annual summit and the second time that it's been in North Carolina, I really want to make sure that we get behind it and support it and get as many of our Durham small businesses and entrepreneurs out there. Uh, it's forecasted to bring about 1,200 folks from across the country. And um, knowing that Black Enterprise has been around for over 40 years, it began as a magazine geared towards driving Black entrepreneurship to a multimedia brand and events firm. And the opportunity to network with like-minded professionals to learn ways to con contract to contract with public and private sector organizations at a time when economic mobility and inclusion are such a pressing priority, particularly for people of color. I'm really pressed to push um, or push and make sure that folks take advantage of the opportunity of learning and networking. So it's timely and extremely beneficial for um, folks to build an alternative ways to grow and sustain their businesses. And I want to say that if, if you're interested and you're here today, um, if you see Andre, I don't see his, I don't see Andre around, Pettigrew. He has a flyer um, which is offering a discount for attendance if you're interested. And then also I want to ask if um, Vivian could queue up hey a video. Hey everybody, this is Earl Butch Graves Jr. A little more volume. And I want to welcome everyone to the Black Enterprise 2018 Entrepreneur Summit being held in Charlotte, North Carolina, June 6th through 9th. I want to invite everyone to join me in what is going to be our biggest and best entrepreneur summit ever. Our speakers this year include Mark Cuban, owner of the Dallas Mavericks, Byron Allen, recently purchased the Weather Channel, Don Peoples, the largest real estate developer in the country, Janice Bryan Howroyd, owner of a $2.7 billion business, and Troy Taylor, the CEO and owner of Coca-Cola Florida. This is going to be the biggest and best event ever. I hope you will come and enjoy Join us for what is the best event ever in Charlotte, North Carolina. BE in the QC, coming to Charlotte, June 6th through 9th. Be there. Come and join me. And I wanted to ask if I could uh, get uh, Mr. Farad Ali from the uh, North Carolina Institute of Economic Development to come up and say a few words about this event as well. Good evening, Mayor, Council Good evening. members, Good evening. manager, and attorney in waiting, right? Chief attorney, thank you so much for the work that, that BE is doing. The Institute is a partner with BE for this event. Um, they came to Durham and we had breakfast at lunch and talked about the importance of really getting minority businesses engaged, small businesses and large businesses. There'll be over 1,200 people there talking about ways to engage these businesses to work. So it's only two hours away. We have a discount with Andre providing that for this community. I think it'd be a great idea for minority businesses and all businesses to kind of engage. We'll have large corporations there. Um, the billion dollar person that you saw up there, Janice Brian Howroyd, is from Tarboro. So she'll be coming with a lot of her friends. So we ask that the citizens of Durham participate in this event. Thank you so much, Councilman Freeman. Thank you very much, Mr. Ali. And thank you very much, Councilmember Freeman. You're welcome. Are there any other announcements? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to just take a few moments to just brag on Durham uh, for a little bit. Firstly, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see Mayor Pro Tem Jillian Johnson here, and who's uh, just back from celebrating the home going uh, of her beloved mother. And Mayor uh, Shul, I know you were there uh, with her. And in your absence, I just wanted to report to you that we had an incredible time uh, in Durham this weekend with about three, by my count, festivals uh, that went on. Uh, the ultimate measure of an organization, the health of an organization, is taken when the leader is not there. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, so you would be very pleased with the way the city carried on in spite of rain. Here in Durham, we call rain ambiance. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had the pleasure of bringing greetings on the mayor's behalf and the council's behalf at the Blues and Brews uh, Festival, firstly, which basically is the totality of my wellness program. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to, wanted to shout out to all of the uh, attendees there. Um, also, I had an opportunity to attend a few of the Moog Fest. Uh, particularly, I uh, was excited about KRS-One uh, being here on a Saturday night. When I was a kid in New York City, you couldn't tell me that I wasn't going to be signed by Boogie Down Productions. Uh, it didn't work out. It didn't work out. <laughs> but we had a wonderful time at Moog Fest. And I also want to echo uh, my colleague, Councillor uh, Freeman's 
uh, kudos to Parks and Rec for a wonderful Bembe uh, festival. We had a, a packed house out there in the rain and the mud, having a great time and peace and, and love and really representing what Durham is all about. So just I want to celebrate all that went on in our city this past weekend. And then finally, Mr. Mayor, uh, we certainly are big on Durham businesses, uh, but there are literally thousands of us in the city that would make the trek from time to time to Chapel Hill to eat at a restaurant on Rosemary Street in Chapel Hill called Mama Dips. Uh, this week, uh, the matriarch, the visionary, the main chef of that restaurant, Mildred Council, affectionately known as Mama Dip, uh, transitioned. And I just want to take a moment to celebrate her life and legacy and thank uh, our friends in Chapel Hill for allowing so many of us from Durham uh, to invade their city uh, for that good eating. Uh, a lot of schemes and dreams were worked out over her food and at her table over the years. And I know I speak for the entire city when we celebrate her legacy uh, and her memory uh, and certainly send our condolences and best wishes to her family and friends. She will be missed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for those announcements very much. Any other announcements? All right, thank you. <clears throat> Are there any priority items by the city manager? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council. Good evening, everyone. I do have one priority item this evening, which is agenda item number nine, the bid contract for ferric sulfate solution, 13%. Would request that this item be referred back to the administration. That's my only item this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do I hear a motion on the manager's priority item? I'll move. Second. Can you uh, open the vote? Please, Madam Clerk. Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Attorney, any priori priority items? No items, Mayor. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk? No items, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much. We will now move to our consent agenda. The consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. Uh, if any member of the council or resident uh, wishes to remove an item from this agenda, uh, we will remove it uh, from the consent agenda. It will be considered at the end of the meeting separately. I will now read the consent agenda items. Item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, Durham Planning Commission appointments. Item three, street and infrastructure acceptances. Item four can be found on the general business agenda. Item five, proposed city county planning department FY19 work program. Item six, FY17-18 emergency solutions grant funds with Urban Ministries of Durham, Inc., subrecipient contract for rapid rehousing services. Item seven, contract for professional engineering services for West Club Boulevard corridor utility rehabilitation. <clears throat> Item eight, ordinance to adopt water and sewer rates for FY2018-19. Item nine has just been referred back to the administration. Item 10, annual property casualty insurance plan, FY 2019. Item 11, changes to pre-audit certification requirements for electronic payments. Item 12, construction services with Riggs Herod builders for the solid waste management annex and truck wash project. Item 13, city code revisions establishing civil penalties for unauthorized work performed in the right-of-way. Item 14, small wireless facilities ordinance revision. Item 15, te telecommunications license with the MCI Metro Access Transmission Services Corp, DBA Verizon Access Transmission Services. Item 16, this item can be found on the general business agenda. Item 17 to 21 can also be found on the general business agenda public hearings. You have heard the consent items. Can I hear a motion on these items? So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve the consent agenda. Can I ask the clerk to please open the voting? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, and now we will thank you. We're going to move to our general business agenda. Just uh, I'm looking at these, uh, okay. Thank you. We are going to, we have two uh, items on our general business agenda. They are item four, participatory budgeting PB follow-up at item 16, proposed FY 2018-19 uh, budget and 2019-24 capital improvement plan, CIP. I'm going to move item 16 up first uh, for our city manager to give uh, the budget presentation for this year. We will follow that with the participatory budgeting follow-up. We have many staff members who are here uh, to hear this budget presentation and 
would like to be able for them to go home and enjoy their families after this is over. And so I'm going to go ahead and move this item uh, up uh, earlier in the, in, the, in the agenda. And Mr. Manager, welcome. We're glad, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Mayor Shule, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, members of the City Council, City staff, residents of Durham present here tonight or viewing on Durham Television Network or following along on Twitter. I'm honored to be before you this evening to present the proposed 2018-19 fiscal year budget for the City of Durham. I would like to note for the record that this marks the 10th budget that I have presented to the community. So by now you're accustomed to our attempts, sometimes far-reaching attempts, to make the annual budget presentation a bit relevant to our lives and to current happenings in Durham and around the nation. Last year, with the help of Huey Lewis and the news, you may recall, we talked about how it's really hip to be square. <laughs> well, after another year, I'll admit that I'm still mostly traditional, and my wife and kids continue to prod and drag me into that pop culture world. When I think about significant occurrences in the city over the past year, <laughs> the word refresh comes to mind, as well as its frequent pop culture references. In pop culture news, uh, you might be aware that in their effort to re-engage television audiences, producers have seen fit to refresh shows that were popular decades ago, such as The Roseanne Show and Will and Grace. So what do you think about when you hear the word refresh? Well, the traditional square me says, let's check Webster's, or maybe even Roger's Thesaurus. Pop culture me says, let's just Google it. <laughs> Either way, the results are about the same. Refresh, to give new strength or energy to, enliven, reinvigorate, update, revitalize, and for computer users, you might even say to refresh to update the display on your screen. Certainly, the city's downtown skyline continues to be refreshed, creating a tapestry of the old and the new. This past year, refresh many buildings around town. The Chesterfield on West Main Street, that was once the center of tobacco industry in Durham, now is a thriving life sciences and technology research center. The Grub on West Chapel Hill Street, that used to be a gas station. The East Durham Bake Shop on the southwest corner of South Driver and Andrew Avenues, which was, home, which was home to various businesses over the years. And the Lakewood and the historic Davis Baking Company. These buildings are just a few examples of refreshed development that honors the past. Almost everywhere you go in Durham, something seems to be being refreshed, re-enlivened, or reinvigorated. This past year has been one of refreshing for our city government logo, too. Our government's logo was refreshed and updated just a little to make it a little easier to use. And our coffees with council sessions were also refreshed this year with the debut of our community conversations. We've even refreshed our water infrastructure. The Williams Water Treatment Plant celebrated its 100th birthday with a major makeover to ensure the historic plant continues to provide consistent, high-quality drinking water to customers in Durham for many decades to come. You'll see this year that while our mission remains consistent to make Durham a great place to live, work, and play, the city's strategic plan and the five goals that are the framework for the activities, programs, services, and initiatives associated with them are new. Change to build on how Durham is transforming to meet the needs of the growing, diverse, and inclusive community that we strive to be. The strategic plan continues to be the foundation of our planning, driving our operational needs, and guiding this annual budget process. Mayor Shule and City Council members have played a vital role in providing guidance as we discuss strategic plan goals and the entire budget development processes, and will be asked to adopt an updated strategic plan in conjunction with the budget adoption process. So as always, I want to say thank you to Mayor Shule and members of the City Council. The development of the FY 18-19 budget relied on traditional collaboration and practices, as well as the previously mentioned refreshed community engagement approach. Whether through participating in community conversations, serving on a board or commission, or taking the annual resident satisfaction survey, City staff gathered input from different groups in our community for how their tax dollars should be spent this coming year in, in this budget. Durham's attractiveness as a great place to live, visit, do business, and attract talent continues to receive national attention. 
And the things that new and longtime Durhamites love about Durham are many of the same things that are driving others to move to this city. Conservative projections are that about 5,500 people a year are moving to Durham, and I think that's low based on what I see happening. And the development and planning services folks can certainly attest to that. There are currently 300 active site plans under review in the Development Services Center, bringing the total for the year to over 800. While all this growth increases demand for services, it also brings an expanded tax base. The taxable value for fiscal year 1819 in Durham will grow by $1.2 billion, $1.2 billion, or 4.46%. That's over twice the amount that our financial model had projected. The increased tax revenues, which will generate an additional $7.27 million, not only provide the resources to respond to increased service demands brought on by this growth, such as two new solid waste collection routes and an additional fire engine company for downtown, but it also provides resources to pay for overall cost increases but even more important, provides additional revenue for affordable housing and park, initiative, park enhancement initiatives because of the increased value of a penny. And even some new initiatives, such as participatory budgeting process, can be funded by these new revenues. The total recommended budget for fiscal year 18-19 is $510.4 million, which is a 15.9% increase from last year. And while that seems like a large increase, a large percentage of the uh, large amount of this increase is primarily due to $76.5 million from water and sewer dedicated housing and stormwater reserve funds to pay for very expensive large infrastructure improvements and affordable housing initiatives. And the general fund, the proposed general fund budget, which covers the city's core services, is $201.1 million a 5.8% increase from last year. I'm pleased to announce that due to the previously mentioned growth in the tax base, coupled with sales tax growth of 5% and continued fiscally conservative management of the budget, I am not recommending a tax rate increase for fiscal year 2018-2019. A penny on the tax rate will grow to $2.9 million. What this means for the average homeowner is a tax bill of about $1,048 per year for the city, or about $87.33 a month, on a house valued at a medium house value of $181,100, which is the same as last year. Proposed general fund expenditures include modest increases for personnel costs and operating expenses, and this year transfer is increased by 7.1% for capital improvement and affordable housing expenditures. The proposed general fund budget uses a little more than $4 million of fund balance for a variety of one-time costs. This fund balance helps safeguard the city against economic uncertainty and emergencies in the future. The city continues to enjoy an outstanding credit rating by all of the rating agencies in part to sound fiscal management and this percentage of fund balance. As was previously mentioned, the city's strategic plan has been significantly updated more than a simple refresh to better reflect and define priority goals and objectives and the infrastructure to achieve them. Again, this year, the city's nationally award-winning strategic planning and performance management will be fully integrated into the city's budget priorities. I would like to take a few minutes to underscore just a few of them. Earlier this year, the topic of shared economic prosperity was emphasized by Mayor Shule's first state of the city address. In this time of rapid growth, one of the biggest challenges facing our city is how everyone can benefit from this growing economy. The Office of Economic and Workforce Development has realigned its strategic focus to encourage a more inclusive economy, and you will be hearing more about that in the coming year. Through wide-ranging partnerships, the city will put a more targeted focus on providing access and opportunities through on-the-job training, youth internships, specialized job recruitment, small business and entrepreneurial development, and targeted job programming for justice-involved residents. In 2018, the volume and value of land development activity in Durham reached historic heights, surpassing the previous, year high of 2000, the previous peak year of 2007. The value of this new construction in Durham County in 2017-18 
was estimated at $1.635 billion, a 46% increase over the value of development activity in 2014-15, which was then $1.17 billion per year. We have almost, as I indicated, we have had almost 800 reviews of individual building site plans to ensure that the sites are built to the city's infrastructure and environmental standards, and over 4,200 building permits this year to date. These are historically high numbers and up almost 20% over the last three years. This level of activity is expected to continue in FY 18 and 19 and for the foreseeable future. The Development Services Center was launched last year to streamline the development review and permitting processes for residents and businesses during this time of major growth. But this process has not kept up with the growth, the pace of growth and development activity. <coughs> A challenge of this growth is ensuring that the city's requirements for building safety, environmental protection, infrastructure quality, and for protecting neighborhood character are met for all new development. To ensure that housing and business opportunities can continue to be served in a timely and high quality manner, we are recommending nine new positions to support the Development Services Center and the Inspections Department. The good news is these new positions, along with two new programs noted on the slide, will be funded totally by development fees, not property taxes, allowing complete accountability to those that we serve. Creating a safer community. A shift in how we think about public safety is also part of the new strategic plan. We recognize that we have to work alongside residents and community organizations in creating a safer community. Partnering to promote a community environment that is safe and free of harm and hazards is consistently a high priority for our residents and for all of the public safety agencies that work to serve them. To better serve a large portion of South Durham, the County Bethesda and Parkwood Fire Districts will merge into the city's fire department, transferring a total of 53 positions and creating two additional administrative and support positions. This will result in more efficient deployment of fire and rescue resources, reducing response times and eliminating duplication of services, and in many cases, reducing insurance costs for residents. In response to the explosive growth of multifamily residential units in the downtown area, we are recommending that 15 new firefighters be added to support a new engine company at downtown station number one to, to occur in January. I would like to take this opportunity to a moment to uh, thank Chief Dan Curia for his tremendous work on both of these issues and his leadership of the fire department for the last five years as chief as well as his almost 30 years of service in total with the department. We wish him well as he assumes the chief position in Charleston, South Carolina in August. At this time, violent crime is trending downward and we believe establishing and maintaining strong relationships between police and the community has contributed to this trend. In addition to including funding for the third year of the take-home car program, funding is also included to include recruitment and retention programs within the police department. The initiative to equip the majority of sworn officers with body-worn cameras has been successfully completed and has shown to reduce complaints and enhance interaction between residents and law enforcement. Establishing positive relationships with youth is also a priority for the police department. So this budget expands the police athletic league program and staffing. Through this program, officers provide mentoring opportunities with youth and their families. The new community engagement unit has been launched, beginning in McDougal Terrace and expanding to the Cornwallis community. This unit with its 10 police officers aims to build trust and strengthen community relations through proactive policing. And I would like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to join the police department and keep Durham beautiful and the Durham Housing Authority for a community cleanup day at McDougal Terrace on Saturday, June the 2nd. This event will also be another chance for officers in the neighborhood to get to know each other. The need for affordable housing continues to be a high priority for the community. The proposed budget continues to support supportive affordable housing goals adopted by the City Council two years ago. Working to provide new affordable home ownership and rental units 
preserving existing affordable rentals, enhancing collabor collaboration with the largest affordable housing provider, the Durham Housing Authority, and ensuring housing and stabiliza stabilization and appreciating neighborhoods continues to be the multi-pronged approach to providing affordable housing. We propose to continue the dedicated housing tax rate this year at two cents while appropriating funds from fund balance to support the remainder of the plan for this year. Also included in the proposed budget is $450,000 to support the realignment and enhancement of the homelessness, eviction, diversion, and support services. This funding, along with similar support from Durham County, will go a long way to aid city and county homelessness and social service support systems that are strained by mounting demands for services as growth pressures housing opportunities for many of our residents. The dedicated half penny for parks continues to make a difference in our growing community. While the half penny was specifically to improve maintenance, another 12 million in other capital improvements will also be underway this year. Refreshing and upgrading parks and trails, including the Hoover Road Soccer Complex and Red Maple, and including the construction of the Hoover Road Soccer Complex, as well as improvements to Red Maple and CM Herndon Park. The My Durham Teen Program, which began last year, will be expanded this year to add another recreation center, while at the same time, marketing efforts are intended to increase and attract more youth to the program. And we also have plans for a summer camp program to be added in 2019. The City County Youth Services Manager approved in the FY17-18 budget has been hired and is aggressively developing a strategic plan for city and county youth initiatives that provide all youth in Durham the access and support they need for success. How we continue to grow has and will continue to be a topic of intense conversation in Durham. While we want growth to meet community needs, we also want it to be environmentally sound and sustainable now and in the future. The newly adopted sustainability roadmap will guide our city in these eight different areas. And while the path to sustainability is different for every community, we've seen through this plan that it touches every area of what we as a city can do. Please take the time to read more about it on the General Services webpage. Additionally, this year, the proposed budget includes funding for the Joint City-County Sustainability Office to update or refresh the Durham Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Plan. The last comprehensive plan was adopted, last city's comprehensive plan was adopted in 2005. As we know, Durham looks nothing like it did 15 years ago, nor are our prospects for continued development the same as they were then. For that reason, we are recommending that a new comprehensive plan be developed to guide growth in Durham. The focus will be to better coordinate city and county services and infrastructure with growth and to ensure that the costs are adequately managed. The comprehensive plan will be completed over a three-year period with the first year involving extensive public engagement, outreach, and participation. Nowhere is gross impact more felt in Durham than in traffic and parking. In FY18-19, the Transportation Department will increase the number of network parking meters and payment options, hopefully making it easy for people to visit downtown areas. Additionally, the city-owned Morgan Street Parking Garage is on schedule to be completed in early 2019, and this will add 669 more parking spaces downtown, helping to relieve the parking crunch that we're now facing. Finally, we'll be taking a closer look at how we can encourage people to walk, bike, ride transit, or car share to lessen traffic coming to downtown and certainly to hopefully improve overall public health. Also of note, the Transportation Department will be bringing parking administration and enforcement uh, in-house, resulting in significant savings and transitioning 23 additional FTEs to the city. Well, I've already mentioned a few capital projects. I'd like to call your attention to the list here on the slide. Uh, in particular, uh, funding, additional funding for the Durham Beltline Trail and the Public Works Operations Center renovation. Maintaining city streets continues to be a concern for residents responding to the 2017 Resident Satisfaction Survey. Approximately $7 million is budgeted to address this ongoing maintenance of city streets. An additional $2 million is included in the capital improvement plan to pave dirt streets that have been petitioned. I'd also like to remind and mention that tonight the council uh, considered the modest increase of about 1.3% for the average customer in the water and sewer rates 
to continue to support ongoing capital operating and sustainability efforts of water and sewer systems. Finally, as I say every year, I never get tired of saying it, I'm continually in awe of the service that our over 2,600 employees strive to provide to our residents. The annual resident satisfaction survey results shows that our residents continue to be pleased with the city, with city employees, and with customer service receiving the highest satisfaction ratings. In fact, seven out of 10 people are happy with the courtesy of city employees, as well as the timeliness and accuracy of the responses that they receive. The proposed budget continues the pay for performance plan with an average of 4% budgeted for general employee compensation increases and 5% is budgeted for sworn public safety employee compensation. Also, as healthcare costs continue to rise, several new benefit vendors are offering a, bro a broader array of benefits and coverage to employees at competitive rates. Funding is also included to begin implementation of the general employee pay and classification study that is expected to be completed this fall. Thanks to funding from the Bloomberg Philanthropies, the city kicked off innovation efforts last year. While this funding, with this funding, the city continues to build on creating and maintaining a culture of innovation internally and externally. In the community, we're supporting innovative startups as they attempt to provide solutions involving technology to problems that vex us every day. I must also recognize the innovation team as they join with and push our partners to find ways to help residents following their involvement in the criminal justice system. The city hosted recently its first amnesty day that allowed residents with suspended or revoked driver's licenses to have them restored. This small thing can make a world of difference, simply either getting a job or taking care of family. Also to better serve residents who contact the city for service or need assistance to pay water bills, additional positions are proposed for the Durham One Call and in Water Management's billing, Customer Billing Services Division. And while the city makes every effort to engage the community as a part of the budget process, new this year is the development of a participatory budgeting initiative intended to involve and engage broader participation from residents to prioritize some project decisions that can directly impact their communities. Approximately $300,000 is included in this budget to support the process with an expectation that the FY1920 fiscal year will include funding to support project implementation. <clears throat> I've highlighted some of the many key recommendations and invite everyone to take a closer look at the budget over the next few weeks. There are many other projects and initiatives that are necessary and contribute to keeping neighborhoods healthy and thriving from meeting our infrastructure needs to keeping our environment clean. Staff looks forward to delving deeper into the details of the proposed budget at next week's budget work sessions. Developing the budget is always a collaborative process, relying on the groundwork of long-term financial and strategic plans developed over several years, and at the same time, trying to predict what the future holds. As always, I would like to give special recognition to Budget Director Bertha Johnson and her Budget and Management Services team, along with the department directors and their leadership, to ensure that our strategic plan guides and aligns with budget priorities as well as growing community needs. And also would recognize Beverly Thompson and the public affairs staff who always do such a great job in helping assist put this presentation together. But it's now time for the elected leadership and the residents to renew and scrutinize the proposed budget. Residents are invited to share their thoughts at a public hearing two weeks from tonight on Monday, June the 4th. We remain committed to transparency in the budget as well as total operations. Copies of the proposed budget are now available on the city's website, in the city clerk's office, and in the budget management services department. And back to the uh, pop culture, I also want to encourage our residents to engage with us on any of these social media platforms listed here. So in closing, let me say FY 1718 was definitely a year of refreshing, while at the same time looking at new and innovative ways to meet the needs of growing Durham. We have a lot to celebrate. In November, our beloved and internationally recognized this coming November, Durham Performing Arts Center will mark its 10th year of operation. And next year, we will commemorate Durham's 150th anniversary. We also celebrate its foundation of inclusivity, diversity, and innovation that continues to successfully propel the city into the future. So at this time, I'd like to propose a toast and council members, you can 
take your choice between this refreshing, Durham's own refreshing water, or thanks to Durham's own Bull City Cider Works, refreshing apple cider. <laughs> so as we prepare for the next 150 years, may the city of Durham con continue to be the great and welcoming city that we enjoy calling home. Thank you. Cheers. 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 That was very refreshing, <laughs> Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you for that outstanding budget presentation. I'm glad your voice did hold out. Uh, but more than that, thank you for that outstanding budget. Uh, this is a fantastic budget. Uh, we are blessed with the prosperity in this town that has enabled the manager to present a, an expansion budget uh, with, where we're doing many, many things that we have been wanting to do. and being able to do so without recommending a tax increase, which is great uh, on every level. Uh, and I just want to echo your thanks to our budget staff and to all the department uh, managers and folks that have contributed to this budget, uh, but also to you, Mr. Manager. Uh, I know that this is something that you put a tremendous amount of thought and effort into. Uh, and. Uh, we always have an amazing budget process, and we always have an amazing budget. But I think this year, is, as since I've been on council, it was probably the best budget that we've had. And uh, just very, very appreciative of that. So we thank look forward you. to presenting it next week. Thank you. Council members, any comments before we move on to our next item? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, uh, Tom, congratulations. It's thank a you. very, very exciting budget. Thank you. All right. Uh, and while we're enjoying ourselves up here, I'm sorry you all don't have any. <laughs> it's delicious. Congratulations to the Bull City Cider Works. Um, we will now move to item four, participatory budgeting follow-up. And um, we have two people that would like to speak on this item. Uh, and I'm going to first explain uh, let me make sure that those are the only two people. Yes, there are only two. Let me first explain to uh, my colleagues how I'm planning to uh, conduct the uh, decision-making on participatory budgeting tonight and uh, hear any comments that you all might have. And then we will um, hear from our two speakers, and then we will proceed. So uh, here is, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Caballero for her work on chairing the committee that brought us this far. Uh, and we are, uh, let's just say that there's seven members of council and we all have our individual opinions, but we got it, she's gotten us this far and I want to appreciate that. Uh, and uh, seriously, very, very good job uh, on, on doing this. And, and she has also uh, provided uh, council and members of the public uh, the agenda item that we have in front of us, which is uh, the, 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 uh, the attachment, which is the guidelines for our uh, participatory budgeting, that's item five. This is the, the addition to our agenda uh, beyond what we, we, what we had previously seen. So council members, here's what I'm going to propose after we hear from the speakers, is that we first work on the participatory budgeting guidelines. I believe uh, that Councilmember Caballero has accurately captured the decisions that we previously made as a group in work session. I don't think there'll be anything in here uh, that we anyone will be surprised at. Uh, and I'm going to ask us first to vote on whether or not we approve these guidelines after we've had a chance to discuss them. Uh, as I say, uh, these were the things that we discussed in detail at the work session, uh, but of course, council members may have other comments on them as we as we go forward today. Uh, but I don't, as again, I, I, I think she did a great job on writing them up, and I don't think you'll find any surprises. 
Then, uh, again, so my plan is to have the speakers, then to vote on the participatory budgeting guidelines, and then to vote on the thing that we have not decided as a group during the work session, which is the amount of money that we will be funding for participatory budgeting. Let me just say for the public to understand, this is a very important aspect of this. The money that is being budgeted for this coming year that the manager referred to is for the implementation of participatory budgeting in the sense of outreach, uh, project definition, and scoping, uh, all the staff work to get ready to implement projects in the, in the following year. The amount of money that we'll be discussing tonight will not be in this coming year's budget, will be in the budget for the following year, the year following. So not FY19, but rather FY20. Uh, but we want to vote on this now. Uh, the, the administration has asked us to do that so that we are able to give them, uh, the, give them and the steering committee that will guide the particip participatory budgeting process uh, some um, uh, so, so that they will know exactly the amount of money that they have to work with and can work towards that. Uh, so that's my plan for the process tonight. Uh, is everyone good with it? Okay. Uh, I'm now going to ask for, uh, we have two speakers, and I'm going to ask them to please come to, to the uh, podium here to my right, uh, and you will each have three minutes. Uh, the first is James Chavis, and the second is Frederick A. D uh, Davis II. So if the two of you all could please uh, come to the podium to my right, and uh, you will each have three minutes. Uh, and Mr. Chavis, I'll ask you to uh, speak first. And we're glad to have you here tonight. Good afternoon. My name is James Chavis. I take 2813 Ash Street, Apartment B. I came to this council before speaking on this prestatory budget that people in our community don't even know anything about. And our tax money is going to be used for the people not to know anything about. Is that fair? Is that an honest procedure way of handling this? We only got one time to hear a little bit about this. And now you already saying that you're already going to put in motion but the people in our community don't know, especially our black people. This is very unfair government. But as we are saying in our black community, this is the democratic way of doing things. This is not a Republican way of doing things to us. This is a Democrat darn way. And it's a sorry way of doing it. So I'm asking y'all, please do not accept this until it get out there in the community and talk to the people that needs to know and understand what this is all about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavis. Mr. Davis, please state your name and address, and you have three minutes. Welcome. Good evening <clears throat> to uh, Mayor Shule, uh, fellow council, and uh, city attorney and staff. Uh, my name is Frederick A. Davis II. I reside at 3706. Uh, Suffolk Street here in Durham. I am a Durham native, and I'm here on behalf of the Durham uh, Committee on Affairs of Black People. Uh, we want to just talk about the budget and the great efforts and strides that uh, city staff have made, in particular the two million line item for the shared economic prosperity uh, that Mr. Bonfield talked about. Um, the council has recently uh, been introduced, and I have a memo that She will share that with us, Mr. Davis. Thank you. We're good. We got it. All right. Uh, council has uh, recently been introduced to the concept of shared economic prosperity uh, by uh, the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, Mr. Andre Pettigrew. And uh, one of the greatest areas of inequity in Durham is around the minority business and entrepreneurship gap. Uh, this is particularly uh, troubling uh, for natives of Durham as myself who know the history of uh, minority economic uh, development here in Durham. Uh, new data by the National Black Communities Conference uh, in April suggests from the data that I shared that African Americans compose 40% of Durham's population. However, they own 5% of the firms that have employees, employ only 5% of Durham's paid employee workforce, 
account for only 3% of Durham's payroll and generate only 2% of Durham's business revenue. In comparison, whites compose 40% of Durham's population. However, they own 74% of the firms that have employees, employ 87% of Durham's paid employee workforce, and account for 89% of Durham's payroll, generates 91% of Durham's business revenue. Research shows that racial minorities, when owning a business with employees, hire more racial minorities as employees than white firms. This shows why it is crucial to have minority firms that are growing and expanding. They hire other minorities. It is important that we begin to assist in the growth of firms from the economic underrepresented minorities in black and Hispanic communities. This memo poses that as a part of the 2018 and 19 City of Durham budget, that two million is allocated to the Office of Economic and Workforce Development for the new strategy of the shared economic prosperity. The funding would be allocated with the instructions to the director and the Department of Housing Authority, uh, Director Anthony Scott, working together to determine a program or project of work for the funds. The funds must be used for the work that supports the intersection of economic development and workforce development strategies with a specific focus on helping underrepresented minority firms in Durham grow and expand in ways that create jobs and opportunities for Durham's most challenging residents, including chronic unemployment populations and the Durham Housing Authority residents. These budget items have potentially have the potential to positively impact Durham in the present and future. Participatory budget, if done correctly, has the potential to increase engagement, civic participation, such as voting, by engaging normal underrepresented voices in the budget process. An effort focused on strategies for growing and scaling underrepresented minorities, firms in Durham, has the potential to increase workforce participation. And so as we refresh Durham, we ask that you leave, do not leave out the underrepresented minorities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. I really appreciate your comments. Thank you so much. And you were heard. Thank you. Council members, uh, you have heard the speakers. And now I'm going to um, ask us to uh, engage in discussion on the guidelines, uh, not the amount of money that we'll be budgeting for uh, the following year's implementation year, but rather the guidelines that are in front of you uh, that we had previously discussed at work session Excuse me. Uh, and would love to hear any comments uh, that you all have. Just, just the point, I'm trying to recall if the public has been made aware of the participatory budgeting presentation. I don't know if we did that here if, or in work session. I think it was, I'm sorry. I'm trying to recall if it was actually done in the public because I'm just thinking about Mr. Chavis's comments about it not being transparent, so to speak. Yeah. And I don't know if they, that everyone's seen uh, Bertha's presentation. So uh, we, the first time the, uh, we had the first presentation, um, we've had a presentation at the council budget retreat. Uh, we had a work session presentation and we had the discussion last week. Those are the three that I can think of. Uh, there may be others as well. Uh, council members may recall others, but that's my, those are my recollections. Yep. I, I, I will agree with Mr. Chavis that not everyone is aware of this, however. And we, that's, that's part of the job we would have to do to make this work. Council member. I wanted to put edit on the Yes, please. Uh -huh. um, in the geographic boundary section, you know, I, I fully expect that you know, should this proceed to a, to a second cycle that we would change the districts, the PB districts. I just wonder if the first line where it says for the first year only, uh, if the word only kind of boxes us in mm -hmm. um, in a way that isn't really critical. Um, and yes. could, you know, if we are hamstrung and have to go to the wards in a second process, we have to amend the guidelines. And I just wonder if we could take the word only out now. Thank you. I think that's a great suggestion. If without objection, we will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Alston. Is there any way to show what we're looking at so that folks at home know what we're talking about? Uh, to put the guidelines up on the screen? Yes. I think we could do that. Um, I'll ask our uh, technical staff if they could look, uh, if they, it would be possible for them to, uh, can we do this, you think? 
put the guidelines up, uh, which is attachment five. Attachment five. Thank you. Attachment five for the participant for uh, item item four. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I want to just, for the record, um, just note that the fact that we're editorializing that the wards may be problematic in the future does not give me any comfort that we're going to use them anyway, the first time around, while noting that they are problematic. Um, and I, I think the reason also says just to adhere to a timeline, and for the record, I'm, I support participatory budgeting, but I, I do not understand why we, we feel compelled um, to constrain ourselves to this timeline. Um, we can take the time and get it right and make sure that there's a system that is reflective of our population that does not have built-in problems, which we have now publicly editorialized that they do, uh, yet we're going to use them anyway, and then better luck the next time around. I, I just don't understand the logic in that. And, and if we proceed, and it looks like we're going to proceed, um, I just want to note for the record that I, I, I have concerns about us opining out loud that there's problems structurally with the ward system, but we're going to use it anyway the first time, and we'll fix it the next time. So, Thank whatever you. that's worth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other comments, council members? Any other comments on the guidelines? I'm going to wait until Vivian. Thank you, Vivian has a chance to put these guidelines up. Or not. <laughs> while, we're, while we're waiting, I would uh -huh. just like to add that also the second um, comment from um, Mr. Davis around the two million for shared economic prosperity. If, um, if, if our workforce and economic development director, Andre is still here, I don't see him. He wasn't. Yeah, nope. I'd love to know what his, his uh, thoughts were on it. Did you have some comments? Yeah. I just wanted to ask his thoughts on. Oh, okay. Well, doesn't look like we're going to be able to get okay. these up in a timely way. Thank you for trying, Vivian. Apologies. That's all right. Council members, uh, what is your pleasure? Uh, we have the guidelines in front of us. You want to read them one by one? Mr. Mayor, I'll move the guidelines in the form as, uh, as amended as earlier stated. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we accept these guidelines with the amendment Council Member Austin uh, 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 added. Uh, and I'll now ask if there's any further discussion on this item. Any further discussion? All right. Uh, we'll now vote on the item, uh, the approval of the guidelines. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The motion passes five to two with Council Member Middleton and Council Member Freeman voting no. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we will now move to the amount that we will be, uh, that we'll be uh, using to implement the participatory budgeting projects that are chosen uh, during the next year. Now we got it. <laughs> now we got it, right. Now we have our participatory budget guidelines. <laughs> Thank you, Vivian. Um, all right, uh, council members, uh, this now we're now open for discussion on the on the amount for the participatory budgeting. I just want to make the comment that it feels a lot like the general legislature right now in our state, and um, I'm a little concerned about that. Mr. Mayor, if I could comment on that aspect just briefly, these materials were made public pursuant to um, the appropriate rules of our process. They are as transparent and available to the people of this city as any other agenda item. Um, and uh, folks who have uh, concerns had the opportunity to review these items and uh, sign up to speak, as two people did. Uh, I just wanted to comment that I don't share uh, my colleagues' concerns about the process nor that characterization. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. 
Any other, any other uh, comments? We are now on the item of the amount of money that we will be allocating uh, for the uh, implementation year. I'll go, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you so much. I want to thank the staff for the work, an incredible amount of work that they've done uh, on this new initiative, this proposed new initiative for our city. I want to thank uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jillian Johnson for uh, quarterbacking uh, and leading this effort and bringing it uh, to us. Uh, there are a couple of numbers that are floating around, a range of numbers, as low as 750000 up to $2.5 million of your money uh, to fund uh, this initiative. Participatory budgeting, in my assessment, is a good idea. It is not, however, a $2.5 million good idea straight out of the gate. I do not um, perceive that my election uh, was about anything uh, but first and foremost uh, creating a participatory economy in the city. And for the folks that are watching this debate uh, at home who are facing eviction, uh, that are underemployed, uh, the opportunity to come to a meeting uh, with fellow residents, including 13-year-olds, uh, to make decisions about bus shelter placement is just not high on their priority list. I cannot make the case with less than six months in office to residents of this city that I found $2.5 million uh, to fund an initiative straight out of the gate, uh, which is an experiment. Uh, this was, and we've heard this echoed by a citizen and a resident, this was not, I'm fresh off of a, a, an election, a campaign, this was not an issue that was talked about by the masses. As I spoke to people, literally thousands of people during this election, what I heard was, we need jobs, we need safety, and we need to stay in our homes. Now, with that said, that is not to say that particip participatory budgeting is not a good idea or we can't have it. I think we can do it both, but I think we can do them, do them both uh, judiciously and with prudence. I've argued for incrementalism in this initiative. Uh, the first time we had a conversation about participatory budgeting, I said, let's do between five hundred and six hundred thousand dollars, which would put us on par with Greensboro, our closest conversation partner, and a larger city, by the way. That would put us on par uh, with it. Um, tonight, I'm prepared to vote for seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which is what our staff has recommended. The same staff <laughs> that did incredible work to bring us a half billion dollar budget with no tax increase. Now, I do not subscribe to the notion that we just in a knee-jerk fashion should rubber stamp what the staff gives us and that we should just slavishly fall in line. But in this particular case, this, this same staff that has come up with a half a billion dollars with no tax increase has recommended $750,000. And that tonight uh, is what I'm recommended. I'm inclined to follow uh, their recommendation. There are voices that started this debate with $2.5 million. There are voices that on tonight are still at $2.5 million. I started at five to 600,000. Tonight I'm prepared for $750,000. $750,000 is serious money. Um, unlike a couple of my colleagues up here, I don't have $750,000. Won't name names. But it's a serious number. It's more than our sister city of Greensboro spent. I think it conveys a serious commitment to participatory budgeting. It's a solid foundation, but it also says that we're judicious and that we're prudent. It also gives us room to escalate as the initiative matures and develops. Our desire or our willingness to embrace incrementalism in our city has already been demonstrated in our policies. Our two pennies for housing did not start as two pennies. It started as one penny, and then we increased it. I don't understand why we can't take the same incremental approach to this important initiative. We have a housing crisis right now. We have a jobs crisis right now. And we have an opportunity to do, to do something dramatic and impactful right now and still in this radical, wonderful way, increase inclusivity and expand democracy with participatory, participatory budgeting at an amount that I believe is responsible, that is serious, but also allows us to put more money into things like workforce development, 
the things you talked about during the election, uh, stabilizing people in their homes, helping justice-involved citizens uh, get apprenticeships and to be prepared. And then we can, in the future, if we deem it as a city, increase the amount, just like we did with the penny uh, for housing. Uh, I would say to my friends and colleagues and allies in the progressive community uh, that I, as I ponder leadership and, and the important attributes of leadership uh, and the nuances of leadership, that one of the most undervalued uh, characteristics of leadership is humility. Just because an idea is a good one does not mean its time has come. People want to participate in the budget at home. And I think that's what our focus should be as a council. And we can do them both. We can have participatory budgeting, and we can also do something dramatic in terms of the things that we talked about in the, during this election cycle. I also would ask, whatever the amount we decide on tonight, I would ask my council uh, colleagues to join me in committing to the people of Durham that we will not raise taxes for this initiative alone. That if we think it's important that we find the money, we reprioritize in our budget, and make the changes we need to uh, to fund this. But I'm asking them to, to support a call not to raise taxes solely for particip participatory budgeting. Easy for me to say, participatory budgeting. And if we do, uh, any revenue that is generated from a tax increase, if any goes to participatory budgeting, that we also earmark some of those funds for some of the priorities and initiatives that have been talked about in this budget and that we've talked about on the election cycle. We can do both. I'm supporting the staff recommendation of $750,000 for participatory budgeting, uh, and I'm also uh, committing not to raise taxes for participatory, participatory budgeting. If it goes well the first year, I pledge you, you will have no fiercer ally on this council to raise money, the levels for participatory budgeting. But I'm standing with the staff tonight and in solidarity uh, with members of this community who feel that there are some other priorities we need to be spending money on. If we, and if we don't spend as much or more on eviction diversion, on uh, a reintegration for justice-involved citizens as we do for participatory budgeting, I think that would send a signal uh, that would not be received well uh, by many of our residents and citizens here in Durham. $750,000 is what I'm supporting. I urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I yield back. Thank you, Councilmember Middleton. Colleagues, Councilmember Freeman. I think, I mean, it's 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 interesting. Um, I've been weighing this out since we started this conversation, and I also am in full support of having a PB budgeting and recognizing that the way that we've gone about this process has brought out all of the concerns around how all of the documentation that's coming from someplace else, all of the idea that's coming from someplace else, we've, we've, we've worked really hard in the last two weeks to try and come together around this. And I think it, it, it could be much better if we spent more time coming together around it so that we're not as divided as we are in how this works and what it's for. I think I had a conversation with uh, Councilmember Caballero, and I was very clear in recognizing, like, I cannot support a process that does not include any race equity in it. There's no conversation about who we're, who we're trying to get to participate. There's no conversation on what the purpose of this participatory budgeting is. The focus is on engagement of who, for what. And as I continue to ask those questions, the answers I get are, are still shaky. It's still not, when I say that this is, I don't say it lightly, that this is like being at the General Assembly right now. The fact that there's no, there's not enough conversation about things that we agree on. Because I think that we could all get behind a wealth, a well co cooperatively planned participatory budgeting process, a well-planned budgeting uh, fund, I, like funding resource. But to, to the point at which I said no was really when, when Mayor Schul said that we would have to raise taxes to do this. 
And I'm really concerned that we're at the point where we're saying that we're having a budget presentation and we've already made the decision that we're moving forward with participatory budgeting, which is not in the budget. And at 750,000, that's still money that has to be found. I'm not, I, I've said it numerous times, I would be willing to, to put $4 million behind participatory budgeting. It is not about the dollar amount. It is really about the process and who is going to be engaged and why they're going to be engaged and how we go about this. And repeatedly, I mean, I, I mean I'm, 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 I'm really speaking to the public on this and, and making sure you understand, like, this is not about me. This is not about these folks up here. This is about you. And as taxpayers in this city, recognizing that the taxes have been increasing, whether you're at a flat tax rate or not, I can't, I can't in good faith support something that's, that's going to raise the tax rate itself and then upon it raise the taxes, the, <laughs> raise the rent, raise the, I mean, continue the displacement. This is a continuous circle. All of it has impact. Our decisions have impact. And if we continue to operate in the silos that we've been operating in based on the council that was here previously, we're going to continue to get the same results because you're not listening to your public as they're telling you they need housing, they need jobs, they need support. They do not need to play with money. Thank you, Council Member Freeman. Other comments? Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've said a lot over the last couple of years about my support for this um, initiative, and I don't think I need to rehash all of that. Um, the $2.5 million recommendation is a um, national best practice of $1 million per 100,000 residents recommended by the organizations, um, the nonprofits that implement participatory budgeting in other um, cities around the country. It would put us um, near the average of the um, cities that have been um, doing PB for a while, the cities that have been researched and documented in the agenda packet. Um, the city of Chicago spends around $17 per person um, on in the districts that do PB. In New York, it ranges from something um, like five to um, $16. Um, I think that putting a significant amount of money into this process so that residents really feel like they're being, um, that they're being asked to engage with a significant amount of money that the projects that they can put forward are significant um, and could really make a difference in their community will have a impact on how successful this um, will have an, an impact on how successful this initiative is. And I think that we, you know, in, in the cities that have the most successful participatory budgeting processes, um, residents are asked to consider spending um, significant amounts of, of money in order to um, really, make, really make the sort of work that they want to see um, in their communities a possibility. Um, we are not talking about funding um, PB in this year's budget because we are um, we're funding implementation in this budget, but not the actual um, projects. Flash flood warning, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, we're we're planning to fund implementation, but not the actual projects until the next budget cycle. Um, there has been very little discussion of raising taxes. Um, I don't think that that will be necessary. We have quite a strong fund balance that could be used to fund um, the projects that our residents decide that they want to see in their communities. Um, and I will be supporting the $2.5 million recommendation for PD. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Pro Tem. Council members, any more comments? Yes, Mr. Mayor, if I may. <clears throat> Um, the, uh, I also want to join my colleague, uh, Councilmember Middleton, in thanking the staff for all of their work on this project. They took an idea and a set of principles uh, that um, has, I think, a lot of value and a lot of, uh, of potential and turned it into um, a way to make this project work. 
Um, they also uh, helped um, kind of put some meat on some options for us, including the recommendation that Council Member Middleton um, is in support of tonight. I also really want to thank Council Member Caballero uh, for leading the committee of the council or the ad hoc committee that we established to do some work on finding common ground around this. Um, I also want to thank um, Council Member Alston and Council Member Freeman for serving on that committee and for delivering that consensus document to us um, at a previous work session uh, so that we could begin that conversation. Um, conversations that happened in public meetings, um, in our work sessions, and in this meeting tonight. Um, I think the, the conversation we had at our last work session around funding was a little bit frustrating for me because um, as I've said from the beginning, I, I'm, and this may be odd, I'm actually somewhat agnostic about the amount of money we spend on this particular project, these particular projects. It's more, much more important to me that we get the process right and that we engage not so much in letting people play with money, but engage in allowing people to have some responsibility over how their money is spent. Um, no matter where we get the money from, whether it's a tax increase or fund balance or some other way, the money belongs to the taxpayers. We took it from them. Um, and uh, the fundamental tenet of participatory budgeting is that there should be some opportunity in a city's budget to take a tiny sliver of that budget and put it in the hands of ordinary folks. Um, and to build a process around them, a deep uh, engagement process around this uh, to encourage people um, to learn more about how the process works, what they see as the needs are in their communities, uh, and to work with our staff um, in developing project uh, proposals um, with uh, hard costs associated with them and, and real benefits to the community, and then allowing residents of this city to vote on how they think uh, the funds allocated for each district should be spent. Vote amongst the various projects that are proposed uh, as part of this, the resident engagement process. Um, and so I, I have been in the uh, perhaps unenviable position of, of not having a strong preference about the amount of money we spend on this project. And so at the last work session, that was frustrating to me because I had one colleague who wanted to spend $750,000 and no more. I had um, another colleague who agreed with that at the time, and now I'm not sure how Council Member uh, Freeman would vote on a funding amount. The mayor uh, expressed his opinion, which he's expressed before and then and since, that a million dollars is the right amount for this project spread out over the three districts uh, that we've uh, decided to proceed with under the guidelines just approved. And then three of my colleagues, uh, including the mayor pro tem, who support an amount of approximately two and a half million dollars. Obviously, that is a huge gulf. Um, and I have um, tried to figure out a way to bridge that. But ultimately, uh, we have to find four votes for some amount, Mr. Mayor. Otherwise, we can't go forward with funding the projects. And that's the task before us right now. Um, uh, I, so my preference would be to try to find some middle ground. Um, I don't believe Councilmember Middleton uh, is uh, fertile ground for me to seek that middle ground given his strongly expressed view, and I totally respect that. Um, but uh, if there were five votes for uh, an amount uh, of around $1.8 million, I think that could get us into trying to find some common ground here. If we can't get that, uh, then I intend to uh, support Mayor Pro Tem's recommendation, although I would ask that she tweak it to be $2.4 million so that the amount is more readily divisible amongst the three districts that we've decided uh, in the guidelines. Um, and so that's where I sit, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Reese. I think at this point I'm going to ask for a, uh, a motion and then we'll continue our discussions. Can I hear a motion? Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we allocate $2.4 million for participatory budgeting. All right. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. It's been moved and seconded that we allocate $2.4 million for participatory budgeting not in this coming year, but in the following year fiscal budget, uh, f following fiscal year. <clears throat> and now I'm going to uh, ask for other comments. Councilmember Capiano. I just wanted to say that I agree very much with what Councilmember Reese said, and I um, 
uh, Council Member Middleton's word of humility, I think that my word right here is compromise, and I think that with seven of us, that word is going to become more and more important. I've had individual conversations with each, almost every single person. Um, I've spent a lot of time on this. I've tried to seek common ground. For me, uh, part of this is allowing people who don't normally get to participate, participate in something very, very important. Uh, I remember my parents being very actively politically growing up and not being able to actually vote for very little, except their taxpayer money still got spent. So there is a huge percentage of our community that doesn't get to vote in our elections. And this is an opportunity for them <coughs> to come to the table and participate in the way that their, tax, they, their taxes get collected one way or the other. And so that's why I find this project uh, to be so compelling because so many in our community are not allowed to vote. And that has always been my motivation behind it. And I have uh, had pretty um, blunt uh, conversations with everyone here, trying to find a number that is a compromise. To me, um, coming up $150,000 is like me coming down $150,000, so that's point, that's 2.35. Uh, that's not a compromise to me. So I will, uh, I want the four votes, and so if we can't come to a number that we all agree with, I will, I will stay at 2.4. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Alston, then Councilmember Middleton. Uh, I'll be uh, relatively brief. I also want to thank our staff and the community for working really hard to get us to this point and to my colleagues as well. Um, and I'll just add that, you know, I too have expressed interest in finding a compromise position, at least on this dollar amount. Um, and in anticipation of us not, not getting there, not getting beyond the four votes, votes needed, uh, to pass the dollar amount, I will also, I plan to support the $2.4 million amount. Um, and I'll just add, uh, just to echo things that have already been said, this is a significant uh, amount of money and a significant investment. And I think it's an investment in um, the capacity of, of, of you all, of our residents, uh, to lead the way in um, serving some of the needs of the community. Um, so I think it's an important uh, investment to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor? I'm sorry, Councilor Mayor. Thank you. I know I promised you. That's okay. That's okay. It's a long night. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to um, I want to be very clear. No one is questioning the virtue of participatory budgeting. And I appreciate the primers and the uh, statements about the virtues of it, but let me reiterate. Everybody up here basically supports conceptually participatory budgeting, the expansion of democracy, more inclusion. These are all wonderful celebratory things. So let us be clear, there's nobody up here that is bashing participatory budgeting. This is about the amount of money. Um, I'm not the best math student, but I believe from 500,000 to 750 is over $200,000 of movement. Um, check my math. Um, we have a motion for 2.4 as opposed to 2.5. Um, I, I don't know if that represents much of a compromise, uh, you know, but here we are. Um, and my 750,000 is not just a compromise. It's what our professional staff has recommended. I want to be very clear. The people that crunch the numbers and do this work daily, the same people that gave us a half billion dollar budget with no tax increase, are the people that recommended this amount. This is not a Middleton amount. Our paid professional staff recommended $750,000. Um, and that's what I'm supporting tonight. Um, if you want to call that a compromise, so be it. But it's a staff recommendation, uh, and it's a recommendation which I intend to support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilmember Member Freeman. And um, I, I want to also echo Councilmember Middleton and recognize him that the staff did make the recommendation, but I, I, want, to, I want to also um, acknowledge that, Council, that Mayor Pro Tem Johnson's recommendation for the dollar amount. It makes sense. It's the timing that I have a problem with, and the timing being right now while we're in a housing crisis where we're at 90 or what 
89.2, occupancy for the county. This is not getting any better. There's just, I, I mean, I just honestly, I, I think that the process is where I, I where you lost me in the participatory budgeting conversation. So the dollar amount was not not my issue, which is why it, either way, I mean, if we're going to do it, we need to do it right. And I want to be clear that if this is what five of us or six of us choose to move forward with, I'm going to be vigilant in making sure that there are people of color representation on the on the committee and in the voting. And all throughout the process, I will not be letting this go. I'll be watching like a hawk. And to be quite frank, it doesn't matter which way it goes. I mean, I win because there'll be more engagement. There'll be more people paying attention to, to the way we're, we're spending our dollars, the, the way we're, I mean, this is, this is a win-win for me. And I, I want to be, be very transparent in saying that The process that you're highlighting and saying like we've we've gone through, we recognize that our process has limited engagement based on people's ability to attend, based on people's ability to access. So to assume that just based on the fact that this has been shared at a work session or shared previously throughout our normal engagement process means we get the same normal engagement. And if we do not highlight that that is an issue, it will not be corrected. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. Any other comments? I have a few, but I'll, any other, anybody else? Uh, thank you all very much. I uh, just have a, a few brief comments. Um, I uh, have been, uh, I have said uh, during, well, for the last several months that I have, am very supportive of participatory budgeting. I'm really appreciative, appreciative of Mayor Pro Tem Johnson's work to bring this to us and to try to educate us over, over uh, a year or two uh, of public discussion and private meetings with us. Um, we've had a whole lot of discussion with this at the council uh, and, uh, and in other forums over the last couple of years, and I want to appreciate that. And I believe in it. And I believe in it because I do think it can do uh, just the this exact thing that uh, Council Member Freeman was referring to, which is it can bring a lot more people into the process. And we do need to make sure that that is, is, that is all the work. We do all, this work as we do all the work that we should be doing with a racial equity lens and that we are making sure that people of color are participa participating in this process fully and that their voices are heard. And if we don't, it will be a failure. I believe that the process that we've gone through with the council to get here has been a good one. And again, I want to particularly thank the members of that committee that have been spoken of before, uh, the three-person committee that got this work done and got it to us uh, in concert with our staff. And I want to thank Bertha Johnson and other members of the budget staff for their work on this as well. Uh, I think we've had a good process. We've, we've gotten to a good place. Um, and I just will say, we just disagree. We just disagree. This is a group that's used to agreeing on a lot, and we just disagree, and guess what? That's okay. It really is. Uh, we have tried hard to come to some sort of uh, uh, agreement on the number. We've, I think we've done a great job of coming together with agreement on the process, uh, but we, we don't agree on the number. That's okay. Uh, I, I have maintained that uh, I, I think the staff recommendation of 750000 is great. I have been saying for the past several months that I would go as high as a million dollars for participatory budgeting. But I think that's enough. Uh, I think that that's a good number. It's a plenty of money to try this out and try it out well, to do it for the first time, and to really see if with a million dollars we can, uh, uh, all the good things that we can do with that and all the people that we can draw into the process. That's a lot of money. Uh, and so that's my figure, and it's the reason that I don't think that uh, I want to go higher. Uh, so 
But I just want to say again to my colleagues, disagreeing in this context is normal. Yes, we have tried to find some common ground on the amount. We couldn't find the common, on, common ground on the amount. So what we need to do is, however this vote turns out, is to all get ourselves behind it 100% and do everything we can to absolutely make it work, just as we do with all of the policies that we vote on, whether or not we were on the winning side. So uh, that's my, those are my words. Um, however this turns out, Let's do a great job and let's make it work. Okay, uh, we have a, a motion on the floor uh, that we approve $2.5 million in FY20. 2.4, Mr. Mayor. 2.4 million dollars? Mm -hmm. Visible by three. Yeah, I thought I said that, I'm sorry. <laughs> 2.4 million dollars, my bad. Uh, 2.4 million dollars uh, on, the, on the floor uh, for FY20 for participatory budgeting. Uh, and if there are no further comments, I'm gonna ask Clerk, to please open the vote. Close the vote. The motion passes 5-2 with Council Member Middleton and Council Member whoop, Mayor Shul voting no. Thank you very much. All right, Council Members. Uh, we'll now move on to, thank you very much for that. And now we'll move on to um, our next item, which is a consolidated item for uh, Fayetteville Commercial. This is a public hearing item. And I'm going to ask now for the staff report. Good evening. I'm Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. A request for future land use amendment and zoning map change has been received from Morningstar for one parcel totaling approximately 2.8 acres located at, 50, at 4510 Fayetteville Road. This is at the corner of Fayetteville Road and MLK Boulevard. The subject site is presently designated low density residential on the future land use map and zoned residential suburban 20. The applicant proposes to change these designations to commercial and commercial general respectively. No development plan was submitted in conjunction with this request. If approved, the request would permit any uses allowed in the commercial general district. Attachment eight in the staff report provides a list of the permitted uses. The Durham Planning Commission at their March 13th, 2018 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by, of the request by a vote of nine to one. Staff determines that this request is not consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan. However, should the plan amendment be approved, the request would be consistent with the comp comprehensive plan. Three motions are required for this application. The first is required to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. The second is to adopt a consistency statement. And the third is um, for the zoning ordinance. And I failed to also mention that the uh, matter has been properly advertised and the affidavits in accordance with uh, such, such are on uh, record um, and in the files in the planning department office. Thank you, Ms. Sonia. Can I ask if those, uh, would you also like to make that same statement about notifications for all of the items tonight at this time? That's correct. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You all have heard the staff report uh, and now I'm going to declare this public hearing open. Uh, we have we have nine speakers. We have four proponents, and we have five opponents. Uh, I am going to um, give uh, each side uh, in this public hearing uh, ten minutes. And that would mean that each of the opponents has two minutes to speak. Uh, the proponents, uh, you all have um, 10 minutes to split between your four speakers. I'm a little bit worried that's not quite enough. I think I'll change it to 15. I'll make it 15 minutes. That would mean everyone, all the proponent, all the opponents uh, would have an average of three minutes to speak. And uh, the proponents, you all would have four speakers to split between your 15 minutes. And now I'm going to ask the proponents uh, to, um, to speak. 
And uh, the speakers we have are Mr. Patrick Biker, Michael Palmer, Mr. Michael Hall, and Ms. Yolanda Hall Long. And they will have 15 minutes, Madam Clerk. Please state your name and address. Good evening, Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council. My name is Michael Hall. I reside here in Durham at 1107 Scranton Place. And I just want to give a brief history of the, uh, the property in question. I'm, <clears throat> I am here with my family and the parcel before you tonight has been in my family for five generations. In 1941, my grandparents, the late William and Callie Jeffries, purchased 10 acres, which included this site. Over the years, the land was passed to different family members. The two parcels now owned by Morningstar Baptist Church were part of the land. My mother was instrumental in bringing that church to the community, following the footsteps of our grandparents who donated the land for Jeffries Grove Elementary School in Port, <clears throat> and were part of founding of Community Baptist on Barbie Road. Our family has always been interested in community building, and this rezoning is no different. Our land was home with many memories, like my father and I walking through the woods to Stratford Lake to go fishing. It was our life. But the generations before it laid a great foundation, but that all changed when Martin Luther King Parkway became our backyard. Ever since the city cut the road in, our property has been separated, no longer an integrated piece within the fabric of the community, which our family had a hand in building. It has been a 20 year journey for my family to figure out what to do with this property since MLK Parkway was constructed and the subsequent improvements that serve to further diminish the property, including another city road project in the works. My mother, the late Brenda Jeffries Hall, pleaded with the city to get assistance considering the condition in which the road projects left our property. She passed in March of 2001 and the family has continued the difficult journey which has brought us before you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, and now we, um, are you next, Ms. Long? Great, we'll hear, hear from uh, Ms. Yolanda Hall Long, welcome. Please state your name and address. Good evening, Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem, member of the council. My name is Yolanda Hall Long of 4510 Federal Road. Giving honor to God for allowing my family this opportunity to be here again. In 2004, Continuing where my mother left off, I attended a JCC PC meeting for the revision of the 2020 Comprehensive Plan. I was advised the plan was at its final stages and that my family would have to use our own resources for our matter to be heard. In 2006, using our resources, we hired Kimley Horn Engineering Firm and applied for a CG rezoning. To date, members of the council, the family has spent close to $50,000 trying to rezone the property that has been left in a non-conducive zoning from effects that are no fault of our own, and it would be an undue hardship to spend thousands more on another development plan. Also to note in 2006, the opponents to the commercial general zoning request wanted the application at that time to be changed to office. I hired mediators to facilitate the meetings and in the end, every use under office and commercial neighborhood presented were rejected by the opponents. <coughs> in the 12 years since, while our property continued to languish, land surrounding us has been rezoned to commercial general with absolutely no opposition. Moving forward, I asked myself, what could my family do better next time? Recalling my grandparents' community building efforts. Ms. Ms. Long, pull away from the microphone just a little. Thank you. Moving forward, I asked myself, what could my family do better next time? Recalling my grandparents' community building efforts and knowing that my neighbors had concerns in 2006, some of whom you have received letters from, were not amenable to a development plan. Learning from that experience, I came back with the community in mind. Our community at large supported the Lowe's development as it brought jobs to our community and much needed road improvements on Fedville and Hanson roads. Our community continues to support and benefit from this project and thus I sought out the team responsible for the work. Although our land, the site has lost its usefulness our family, from my siblings to cousins, all live in and love this neighborhood. 
Presently, the community agrees that the site is not conducive for residential and that we all want the right type of development. My family asks you to please consider these things along with the strong merits of our case, the strong recommendations from staff and the planning commissions as justification for our application. And we ask for your favorable vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Long. Uh, Mr. Biker. Good evening, Mayor Shule, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, members of the City Council. Just want to make sure our PowerPoint is up since that'll be the uh, main point of my conversation with you this evening. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. Sorry, just making sure we don't have technical difficulties. No worries, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I'm with Morningstar Law Group here in Durham, and I'm here tonight representing Yolanda and Michael Hall. I'd like to give you all a brief history of this site starting in 1993. At that time, Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway had not yet been built. The vertical line next to the site was a two-lane Fayetteville Road. Fast forward 11 years to 2004, and the city had built Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway thanks to a voter-approved bond referendum. Jumping ahead to 2010, the Lowe's Home Improvement was built, and that project spent $3 million on improvements to Fayetteville Road. Looking at the site in 2017, you can see Yolanda and Michael's property is right next to a very large intersection of two major thoroughfares, each of which carries 19,000 cars per day. Based in part on these traffic volumes, you can see our future land use map has the two corners on the north side of this intersection designated for commercial, while across Fayetteville Road is designated for industrial. Given that almost 40,000 cars per day go next to Michael and Yolanda's property, we respectfully ask for the fourth corner to be designated as commercial. Next, in regard to site constraints, today the site can only be accessed as right in, right out. As stated in the staff report, the city has funded major road improvements to Fayetteville Road so that the streets to the south all will become right in, right out as well. We think this impending right in, right out access limitation is a much greater change for the residents of Hanson Road than retail development on the Hall property. Keep in mind, most of the homes on Hanson Road are much closer to the Lowe's home improvement than they are to Michael and Yolanda's property. Even with those distances you see on this slide, it is vital to note that there is a significant valley with a stream that contributes to a permanently preserved approximately 300 foot forested buffer between this site and any existing residence. In addition to this large buffer, the UDO mandates a perimeter buffer within the Hall property that consumes three quarters of an acre. As I mentioned earlier, the city has funded road improvements for Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway and Fayetteville Road, and those improvements will, re I'm sorry, will remove another quarter acre, leaving less than two acres that can actually be developed. In conclusion, I think these longtime property owners have sacrificed enough. Their longtime stewardship, while all these changes have gone on around them, warrants approval of this rezoning so this family can receive fair market value for their property. As residentially zoned property, the site is basically worthless because just the grading <coughs> costs would run between four hundred dollars and $500,000, and that would make new homes completely unaffordable. For all these reasons, we respectfully ask for your approval. And now to close out our team's presentation, I'll turn it over to Mr. Michael Palmer, representing UDI. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Mr. Palmer, please uh, tell us your name and address. Uh, Michael Palmer, 2804 Tavistock Drive. I come here as representing UDI as the uh, vice chair of the board. So Mayor Scholl, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, council members, and uh, Manager Bonfield. Uh, 
again, we unanimously, our staff and board unanimously, unanimously support this project. We're neighbors to this area, as well as it fits perfectly in the mission of what UDI is all about, about bringing um, development, economic prosperity, if you will, to uh, particularly uh, the African American uh, business community. So that said, I think this support for this project, I ask for your support, but I think it aims perfectly at your objective of sharing prosperity in this growing community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Shule. That uh, concludes our presentation. We'd like to reserve the last six minutes for rebuttal and uh, the clerk is sharing the letters of support from UDI and from another neighbor, uh, Dr. Charles Sanders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Biker, and you all do have six more minutes remaining. All right, uh, now we will hear from the opponents, and uh, I have here the names of five opponents. I'm gonna read your names, and if you all could gather over here by the podium, that would be great. Um, Barry Everett, Tanuta Filial Rogers, David W. Lister, <clears throat> Jesse Burwell, and Tara Warwick. If you all could, please, good, thank you. And uh, you, you're able to go in any order you would like to go in. So Pardon me? You can start in any order you would like. Would you like to begin? <laughs> Not really, but I will. Right. Thank you. Well, please, I'm shy. <laughs> please state your name and address. Okay. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mayor Shul, members of the City Council. Um, my name is Barry Everett, and I live at 812 Turmeric Lane in the community of Green Gardens, just two short blocks away from the southwest corner of MLK Parkway in Fayetteville Road. I'd like to express my concerns, which my neighbors share, about the proposed rezoning of this corner from residential to general commercial. My husband and I spent our retirement savings in 2003 to buy our home here because it was away from the concrete landscape of commercial development. Now we see commercial development chasing us. On the northwest corner of MLK in Fayetteville, where there was once nothing but a beautiful tree line, we now have a Lowe's home improvement and an auto zone. This commercial development has increased traffic on Fayetteville Road to the point where, at certain times of day, my neighbors and I can no longer make a left turn out of Green Gardens to get to MLK Parkway. Instead, we must go back to the end of Green Gardens to get to the Bay Point community's exit onto MLK. With the southwest corner property in question only permitting a right turn exit onto Fayetteville, we fear that motorists leaving a business that would be here would also use our street as a cut through to MLK. And with so many young children in our neighborhood, this is a concern. Since Ms. Long, the property owner has not included a development plan with her rezoning request, any business is possible. We would not want to see it used for a Sheets gas station, 7-Eleven, or other business open late into the night. It would bring bright lights, noise, pollution, which we already get from Lowe's, and as previously mentioned, much heavier traffic on already overburdened Fayetteville Road. We realize Ms. Long has had difficulty selling her property and is desirous of rezoning, and we're not unsympathetic. After discussion, my neighbors and I agree there are commercial businesses we would be amenable to. These would include things like a dry cleaner, professional or medical office, bank, daycare center, bakery, bookstore, and many others. What they have in common is that they are neighborhood-friendly businesses and are not open late into the night. We would agree to the compromise suggested by Planning Commissioner Tom Miller at the commission's meeting on March 13th. That is that the property owner change her rezoning request from general commercial to the category of commercial neighborhood. Commercial neighborhood would 
lists you a list has a list of uses that is reduced to those most likely to provide welcome community services and the size of buildings are limited to a smaller scale in conclusion i ask that the city council consider the impact that commercial general commercial rezoning would have on the surrounding neighborhoods and i ask that you vote no to the proposal as it now stands thank you thank you ms everett there was no reason to be shy you spoke very well <laughs> Uh, Ms. Filial Rogers. Yes. Mayor Schultz, um, Mayor Rotem Johnson, and members of the City Council, good evening. Good evening. My name is Tanita Filial Rogers, and I live at 726 Hanson Road. I'm a native of Durham, and I grew up on Hanson Road. When my father moved to Durham in 1940s, he eventually purchased roughly 20 acres of land on Hanson Road to allow his children to build homes around him, and that's just what my sister and I did. We have more than an interest, it, we have more than a vested interest in Hanson Road and the surrounding community. Our property resides, my property, I'm sorry, our property represents blood, sweat, and tears and sacrifice our father endured for our family legacy. My family and the Hanson Road community understands the need for Durham's growth and development, but not at the expense of our quality of life. My neighbors and I understand Ms. Hall wanting to rezone the property, but a commercial general zoning is unfair to me and the rest of our neighbors. Why? As you are aware, there's no development plan attached to this request, nor is there no way of us to ensure the future commercial development there would be attractive, compatible, and dis disruptive to our community. And I, in my opinion, without a development plan attached to this rezone request, the only viable solution to this dilemma is to rezone the property in question to commercial neighborhood instead of commercial general. Please keep in mind that in 2006, both Ms. Hall and Morning Star Baptist Church asked the city council to rezone their properties, which would take up the entire corner, corner of the stoplight where Martin Luther King is at Hanson Road, from resident to general commercial, and the city council denied the request. So more than likely, if you approve Ms. Hall's request for general commercial, Morning Star Baptist Church will be next. When will it end? I want to propose a compromise and recommend that the city council approve a commercial neighborhood zoning for this particular partial of land and ask you to vote no in the applicant's requested plan and commercial general zone change. CN is designed to be less in intense commercial zoning. The size of the building allows CN to limit to the neighborhoods. <coughs> the size of the buildings allowed in CN is limited to a neighborhood friendly scale. The list of use is reduced to those most likely to provide welcome neighborhood services. Although small, the property zone CN could be subdivided into two CN scaled businesses. And just on a personal note, Yolanda and I have grown up together since we were in kindergarten. We went to elementary school, Pearson Town, Giffins, and, and Jordan together. And so we are on the, this is killing us because we grew up together, but we're on the opposite sides of the scale. Aww. And so the difference is my family has three generations that's on Hanson Road, and we're still there, and we continue to be there. We're going to continue to be there. So a compromise for us is a commercial neighborhood, and I think that would be the best compromise for both of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Filial Rogers. Uh, Mr. David Lister. Good evening, Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, honored council members. Um, thank you for your service. I hope you are enjoying your cider. I could use one right about now. Um, I represent the Hope Valley um, Farms North um, HOA. I'm their vice president. I represent over 900 homes. Now, this position isn't like what you saw in Over the Hedge, where we, we measure grass and we look at this sort of thing. That's, that's ridiculous. It's, it's about neighbors and family. It's about me borrowing an Allen wrench from my neighbor to put my wife's bike together. 
It's about me dressing up in, I'm in my pajamas borrowing eggs from my neighbors. It's a community. We have an officer that patrols our community, and he takes care of copperheads in garages. He fixes flat tires. He watches over homes that are on vacation and under construction. And he said the problem with MLK is that it divides District 3 and District 4. And it's kind of considered no man's land when it comes to police. We've seen an increase in crime in our community. And unfortunately, the man that was mentioned today, Hong Zing, was one of our residents. We want to continue to be safe. Also, our roads, Juliet and South Roxborough, get incredible amounts of traffic. There's tailgating, there's speeding. And unfortunately, there is this, this problem we all have. We, we, we're ruled by these things. We, we no longer talk to each other. And it makes problems, especially on the roadway. Currently, I was passed at a red flashing light with my kids going to school because I didn't want to get T-boned. That road's going to get worse with the construction on it. It's going to be bike lanes. So I propose a commercial neighborhood. We want pedestrian safe areas so we can continue to be neighbors, friends, family. And I really appreciate the hard work you do, the hard work we do. If you see the residents here, we're diverse. And I'm grateful for this opportunity because I've made friends in Green Gardens, on Hanson Road, Bay Point, and for my community. And just a very happy birthday to Barry, who came here on her birthday night to talk to you, to be involved in this process. So I think she, you know, she deserves a side or two. So <laughs> thank you for your service. Thank you, Mr. Lister. Uh, and now we will hear from Jesse Burwell. Mr. Burwell, welcome back to the to the Durham City Council Chambers. We thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for all that, all those many, many wonderful years of service that you gave here. Thank you, sir. Well, Mayor Shull, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, members of the City Council, Mr. Attorney and Mr. City Manager, good evening. Uh, my name is Jesse Burwell and I reside at 718 Hanson Road. I've lived on Hanson Road for the past 26 years and I've been a resident of Durham for 45 years. I moved to Durham when I got married back in 1973. And I want to take a few moments to express my concerns about this rezoning request. My concern is this. A commercial general zoning is intended for commercial general uses, so there would be no guarantee what type of business would end up being on the property in question. If you approve this rezoning request, it will more than likely pave the way for future commercial development that may not be compatible with our neighborhood and could adversely impact property values and our current quality of life. A commercial general, zon a commercial general zoning of Ms. Hall Long's property, I feel is unfair to the surrounding uh, neighborhoods like the old Hanson Road community, which I represent, uh, Bay Point, Green Garden, and others. Why? Because the development intensity allowed in commercial general is inappropriate, I feel, for land located next to a low-density suburban residential neighborhood like ours. We feel the applicant should really include commitments in a development plan to make sure the property, when developed for commercial uses, will be a good neighbor to our surrounding homes. Without this, there is no way for us to ensure have any control of future commercial development there, uh, that it would be a good fit for our surrounding neighborhoods. Also, in my opinion, the applicant's request is not consistent with the comprehensive plan's policy for protecting neighborhood character and making sure non-residential infield development in the suburban tier respects existing development patterns and community, above all, community character. In 2006, as Tanita said, uh, both Yolanda Hall Long and the Morning Star Baptist Church asked city council to rezone both their properties from residential to general commercial, and the city council at that time denied the request. So more than likely, if you approve this request, uh, uh, Morning Star Baptist Church will be next and others. So please keep in mind that those who support this request don't 
live in the old Hanson Road community or any of the surrounding communities like Bay Point or Green Gardens. I, what I want to do is just like a couple of the other speakers did, and that is propose a compromise and recommend that City Council approve a commercial neighborhood zoning for this particular parcel of land. I feel a commercial neighborhood zoning would provide for small scale retail and service developments which would be more compatible with and serve the convenience needs of small neighborhoods like ours. I feel if you approve a commercial neighborhood zoning, it would be a fair compromise to all involved. Uh, I, and I want to thank you for your time and consideration of my recommendation. And we did have a few members of the community uh, that support this recommendation to come out, and I would ask that they stand at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burwell. Thank you very much. Uh, and we will now hear from Tara Warwick. Good evening. Ms. Thank Warwick, you. you see that you have a little over two minutes? Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you also for the opportunity to speak. My name is Tara Warwick. I live at 4605 Coral Drive in the Bay Point community. And I am a homeowner in the Bay Point community, which is located next to the property in question. Those of us who own houses in the neighborhood purchased our homes while the property in question has been zoned as residential suburban. When making the decision to purchase our homes, we did not have the opportunity to evaluate the area while zoned as commercial or the impact that would come from that, such as increased noise, traffic, light pollution, et cetera. Commercial neighborhood would be a reasonable alternative that was created specifically for circumstances such as these. If it's not considered here, the option of commercial neighborhood will be rendered a dust collector on the books. I ask that you vote no for the current proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Warwick. All right. Um, I'm now going to uh, ask if the proponents would like to offer any more. Good evening again, Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, members of the City Council. I would like to briefly address some of the uh, points that were made by uh, the folks you just heard from. Uh, first of all, in regards to commercial neighborhood, it's very important to look at what that zoning district requires under the UDO. It limits the building size to 5,000 square feet. However, in terms of uses, it's generally the same as commercial general. So, for example, fast food with a drive through is permitted in both zones. I bring that up to say if we were to proceed with commercial neighborhood, you would be limiting the building footprint to 5,000 square feet, and that would be driving the end users to be the, the fast food type restaurants. I bring that up as a contrast because commercial general would allow for a multi-tenant building greater than, greater than 5,000 square feet, say it'd be 10,000 square feet. We could then put neighborhood businesses in there at a much more affordable price than what commercial neighborhood would allow. So in terms of attracting local businesses, commercial general would be a better fit for that. In regards to lighting and noise, the ordinance standards are the same. I also want to bring up the uh, references to Morningstar Baptist Church. We have not been approached at all by Morningstar Baptist Church ever since we started this process. They have not called me, they have not called the halls, they have not contact, contacted us in any way, shape, or form to ask uh, how the case is going or if they could join up uh, with this, uh, with their uh, property. So we're not aware of any intention on their part to resume, resume I'm sorry, to rezone their property. I want to keep in mind that all of these objections were heard by the Planning Commission and they voted nine to one to recommend approval to the City Council. And I also want to bring up the neighborhood character issues that have been brought up. If there were significant neighborhood character issues, they would have been pointed out in your staff report. I've been doing this type of work for 20 years in Durham and uh, I thought the staff report that was presented before you tonight was one of the cleanest ones that I've ever seen in regards to a development proposal. And so I want to Bear in mind why we showed you the history of this site over time. It was turned down in 2006 because Fayetteville Road was a two-lane road. There simply was no traffic capacity at that time. 
Now, fast forward to today, we have the city moving forward with significant improvements to Fayetteville Road above and beyond what's already there to four lane it from Cornwallis all the way down to uh, Spate's uh, auto repair shop down at uh, uh, Barbie Road. So those road improvements are going on today. That will provide additional capacity. And again, that will make the entire area a right in, right out access for all points south of Martin Luther King Parkway. So I do want the council to be assured we evaluated commercial neighborhood very carefully before we turned in this application. We thought it would militate <coughs> against having affordable rents for local businesses. If you think about Dillard's, it was a fine local restaurant that we had in this area for many years, and then the folks aged out, and they've never been able, companies like that can't find affordable rents in the area. So in terms of the uses, I think in terms of CN and, and CG, they're very similar, but the 5,000 square foot cap on a building we felt was inappropriate for this, given that there's almost two, two acres of land that can be developed. A 5,000 square foot footprint would leave 85, 90,000 square feet of just vacant space around that building. And so we think commercial general makes more sense. The standards are essentially the same, and we believe this is the right way for this property to be developed. And it is, again, uh, consistent with the other development that's happened at this intersection, which has almost 40,000 cars per day at this location. Do you have anything else? Good evening again, members of the council. Good evening. Uh, as I said earlier, I know we've talked a lot about 2006. In 2006, again, I worked very, very hard in good faith to work with my neighbors. 12 years, I've heard nothing from my neighbors. We have continued to be crowded out. We've had commercial, residential, infrastructural changes, nothing. My neighbors have been talking about traffic, I didn't even see my neighbors at Hillside High School in 2016 when they talked about ST-264, the road widening of Federal. Where have my neighbors been in the last 12 years? Commercial neighborhood, I asked them to consider commercial neighborhood in 2006 when my next door neighbor was zoned commercial neighborhood, Massey's Bait and Tackle General Store. I don't know what more I could have done I understand the new developments of Bay Point and Green Gardens. They come to speak. We were there years before that, and unfortunately, we can't be a part of that the way we are on this on, on the intersection. So I don't know what more my family could possibly do than, than we have. Um, so that's all I can really say. We have done it. We've tried it. And this is how we've been left after 78 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Long. We'll be happy to answer any questions. And <coughs> Thank you very much. Council members, you've heard from the speakers on this item. Let me ask now, is there anyone else who has not been heard that would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else who has not been heard that would like to be heard on this item? All righty. Uh, now I'm going to uh, ask that the if there are any questions by council members uh, for members of the staff, Mr. Young, did you want to add something? I did. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council, Pat Young with the planning department. Just a point of information. Um, the uh, applicant was, is correct that by right, meaning without any additional action, uh, 5,000 square feet is the maximum size in the compact neighborhood or CN district. But you, uh, I want to make it clear that you can go up to 20,000 square feet uh, with a minor special use minor special use permit from the Board of Adjustment. So just for that, that's just a point of information. Thank you. Councilmember Austin. Uh, thank you. A couple questions for staff. 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 <laughs> Very quickly, just to clarify, um, commercial general CG is the broadest commercial zoning category. It is. And there are no hardship exceptions to um, uh, the development plan requirement for uh, approval of a rezoning. Well, well, there's no no requirement for a development plan. Development plan's a, a voluntary um, 
option that a developer has to bring before you all to provide uh, proffers above and beyond the ordinance minimums. Got it. Thank you. Um, and a couple questions. Yes, well, Councilman. actually, for the for the property owner, but you're speaking I'm on their. Sure happy to answer. Um, for the property owner, I think. Oh, I'm Parker. sorry. Yes, um, I just am just curious. Mm -hmm. um, is it your intention, is particularly with a, uh, to rezone to this uh, broad of a zoning category? Is it your intention to sell the property at some later date for the commercial development? We would like to be able to market the property. We've had no opportunity to market this property. It's literally been put in a position where there's no, no market under a residential. Right. So it may be, this may be for you, Mr. Biker. Hypothetically, if you found a buyer, a developer who's interested in the property, you could condition the sale of the property on the successful rezoning to, to CG. Just. I'm sorry. Run that you, could, can, you could contract. You could the, the property owner could condition the sale of the property on the rezoning. We could do that, but the problem is, and I've seen this happen many times over 20 years. The people who lose out in that are the property owners, and this is an African American family that's owned this property for over 75 years. Uh, the I have to tell you, the the last slide that we showed you that that shows how a development plan for this project would have cost about $46,000. Uh, until Yolanda and Michael approached me to represent them, I had no idea that the fees were that high. I had no idea. Uh, she did, <laughs> which she's a lot sm smarter than I am. Um, and so we talk a lot about shared prosperity, but if you can't even afford the fees to get your application in, how can you ever have shared prosperity for a family that's been uh, that's owned property for, for this many decades. Uh, and so what would happen, a developer would uh, take all the soft costs out of the, out of the purchase price, and that would be, uh, I, I mentioned the grading cost, uh, 600, I'm sorry, 400 to $500,000. Well, that'll be taken out of the purchase price. All the soft costs be taken out of the purchase price. Before you know it, Yolanda and Michael get half of the fair market value for their property. And so that's why asking for this Zoning designation today puts this African American family in a position to uh, receive fair market value for property that they've owned when roads have been dramatically, road infrastructure has been dramatically increased in this area. Commercial development has dramatically increased in this area, and the industrial development that UDI represents has been across the street for a long time. And uh, if they can't afford even submit an application, and they have to have a developer do it, then they will lose the profitability that they should justly enjoy after owning pro a piece of property for that long a time. It's a great question, though. Thank you. Other questions? Councilmember? Councilmember Caballero, and then Councilmember Middleton. I have a question for staff. Question for staff? And this may be putting you all on the spot. So I know that we are talking about changes to how we do um, plan reviews and whatnot in the future, partly to make it easier for individuals where it's not so cost prohibitive. Is this an example of something that we would potentially be moving away from in the future? Pat Young again with the planning department. Um, I do think this is a, a good example of the item that uh, the mayor and several members of council have brought to our attention uh, over the last several months, which is an alternative for applicants be, uh, above and beyond the current development plan, which has very rigorous and ex extensive standards, which result in a fairly high cost that you've heard from Mr. Biker characterized, um, that would allow applicants to provide uh, assurances to the community and to council, uh, binding assurances at a, at a much lower cost. And we intend to deliver that to you all during the coming fiscal year in FY19. Uh, since we last talked, I've talked to my staff at detail, and we feel like we can do that. But it would probably be at least six months with our other work plan items. But yes, this is an example where that could be used. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for the staff, do, do, does anybody know what the Planning Commission vote was in 2006? I'm sorry. Off the top of my head, I do not. Okay. Um, for, for the... Applicants, oh, over the, good to see you, by the way, oh, over the decades, 
Have you ever received an offer to have your property purchased? Yes. Actually, we did probably in 2012. In 2012, we had a, a, a developer look at the property. They liked the corner site. Yes. Any time that was 2012 the last time? 2012, and then the contract ended in 2014. 2014. Any time before that uh, that you can recall? We've had a lot of people look, but nothing. We've had several people look over the years. Right. As a matter of fact, like in 2006, when they talk about the pharmacy, that was a big time for pharmacies coming around, and pharmacies looked, but no, we've... But no, nothing has materialized. But you did have a hard offer in 2012? Yes. And yes. You, you didn't take it? No, no, no. It, it just, it did not materialize. We certainly went under contract with them, but the due diligence that they did, um, they found out there wasn't going to be any right in, right out. So our property lost full access. So on top of everything that's happened over and over and over again through the city of Durham, we lost full access to the site. Mm -hmm. So losing full access then stripped a lot of, you know, who might be interested in the site because they can't, they won't have full access. So once that happened, that fell apart. So, so my understanding is, from what Patrick says, and I think Mr. Bill Judge, somebody would have to <laughs> at least be able to get access onto MLK because we don't have full access on the site like we used to. So that's a, that's a huge thing that changed in, in years. How would, you, how would you respond to, to residents and citizens that, that would say that your family just waited too long uh, to, to make a move on the property and development and, for lack of a better term, progress just went on, and now the government's basically being asked to put you in a position uh, to maximize profitability? H how would you respond to that? Could you repeat that question? Uh, for residents and citizens that might say that your family uh, waited too long to, to sell the property or make a move on it, and as development went on, uh, now the government is, central, is essentially being asked to um, um, put you in a position to be more profitable um, because you didn't jump on an opportunity. Whether, and I, that's why I asked, have you had any prior to now? Mm -hmm. How would you, because when fo you know, folk come at us from all angles. How, how would you respond to that? Well, I didn't wait too long. Mm -hmm. We went through the process. You know, it takes a long time to come up with additional money each time you have to come back. But I, we've been doing this for years. I've come. We've come. 2004, 2006. You know, it takes money to be able to keep coming back. Uh, so, no, I, I don't think it's, we waited too long. And it's never too late. And you just move forward. And that's what we've done. We keep moving forward. You know, I just want to, I'd like to piggyback on that. Account, the commissioner, Commissioner Williams said something, and I'm going to echo what she said. She said, um, I've been in that area for 40 years, and that house has been a staple. I'm surprised it has survived this long. It has survived, sort of echoing what my friend Tanita says. It survived because I know the sacrifices it took for my grandfather to be able to, in World War II times, be able to get that land and pass it down to his family. She's been blessed. Her, her sister has a home on their family land. She has it. Her mother and father had it. We didn't get that same thing because by the time all the changes happened, we don't have that opportunity. The only option we have is to try to at least rezone it. And that's where we're at. Thank you, ma'am. One last, thank you so much. Your, your, your family is vener venerable in our community and, and the site is legendary. I do have a question yeah, sure. for you in light of what um, uh, staff said about the ability to, to perhaps get a, um, a special uh, use exception, mm -hmm. lifting sure. the cap from 5,000. Does that in any way change your, your argument profile against commercial neighborhood? Not particularly, Council Member Middleton, and, and here's why. Uh, it, it's still, it would still be very difficult for Yolanda and Michael to sell the property with that contingency out there because that is another discretionary approval that goes to the Board of Adjustment, which means that the Council's rezoning today would still have another significant hurdle to be cleared in order for some 
in order for somebody to purchase the property and develop it as a as a as a commercial use. So it's still a contingency, and people on my side of the fence in the development community hate uncertainty, and that's an uncertainty that by by state law is cannot be determined until the Board of Adjustment actually votes on it, and they have to hold a public hearing just like this one, notify all the property owners within 600 feet, I believe, which means who knows what the Board of Adjustment would decision would be. And keep in mind, the staff report that you have before you is a very clean staff report in regards to the issues relate to commercial development at this location. Do you remember what the Planning Commission vote was in 2006, or were you, was that? Oh, I, I, I know all of them. <laughs> do you? They were, they were pretty bad in 2006. Yeah, 2006 Planning Commission probably was, I don't even have, we had maybe 12 or 13. I think two, three out of maybe 13 said yes. And no, no. We're, we're talking about the Planning Commission 2006. And the, the City Council was um, only two voted for me. Um, but again, even though that happened, Seeing that what happened, and actually our case was a catalyst for how it's run today. We had a pretty big case. We had like 600 supporters. They had 200 and something uh, opponents. I had mediation to try to come to a middle ground. They're talking about compromise today. You couldn't have tried to compromise more than my family tried to compromise. And in the end, um, Mayor Bell, even though we lost, he looked out and said, you know, if any of the stuff starts to happen to the north, this piece of property cannot stay residential. It is not conducive. I know people don't want to hear it, but it just cannot. But we've languished for an additional 12 years um, while nothing again has been opposed, not just to the north, but even to the west, N not even the road changes. So we have these people, my, my neighbors, my friends, telling you they have all these concerns and they have been dormant for 12 years. We come back, here they are. And nothing else has mattered to them. Nothing. And so it, it is it's perplexing to me. It baffles me as Tanita stood up here. This was someone who says I was like a sister to her. She's like family to me. And I don't understand why every time we come forth, it's they drum up this opposition. If we're not here, there's nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Middleton. Any more questions, sir? Yes, Mayor Shaw. Councilmember, anything else? No. All right. Councilmember Freeman, then Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Uh, I had a question for staff and then also for um, Mr. Jesse Burwell. Just, um, if you could just jog my memory, I'm just trying to make sure I know. Is there a cost for text amendments? Or I'm not texting. I'm sorry. For test for cost for um, commit text commitments. I'm sorry. Yeah. So committed committed elements being added to your zoning request. No, there is not a added cost for text commitments or design commitments added to a development plan. Under certain uses, when you apply for a development plan, they are required. Okay. So if you have a if you have a zoning case like this and you wanted to make a text commitment specifically, is that possible? The only way to provide a text commitment is to provide a development plan. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. and Under the current provisions. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So specifically, you mentioned the. I mean, I heard that there was no compromise, and then I'm hearing you present a compromise. Has this conversation happened between? you were the developers at all? We, we talked to the, the lawyer and Yolanda earlier, and they were just kind of dead set on commercial general. At the end of the day, the community is not trying to stop her from rezoning a property. We just <coughs> want some say in what goes on that piece of property because it's virtually will be a part of our community. <coughs> And then you mentioned a protection of the neighborhood. I couldn't catch it. You were talking pretty quickly. If you could repeat that part of what you were saying, that would be helpful. Uh, protecting the character of the neighborhood. Um, 
And we felt like commercial neighborhood would allow for businesses or commercial establishments on that piece of property that would be more compatible with our neighborhood and other surrounding neighborhoods. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, just a question, uh, Ms. Tara Warwick? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Tanita Rogers. Tanita Philia Rogers. Philia Rogers. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, and then Ms. Tara Warwick. Um, you, you were talking about kind of your family's uh, land yes. on, make, so tell me the street name. On Hanson Road. On Hanson Road. Yes. And how long you've lived there, multiple generations. Have you guys ever tried to coordinate any type of purchase across to that piece of land? Coordinate. Has there been any conversation about transferring that property to your family? To which the, the Hall's family, to our family? Yeah. And do we want to purchase that family? I just, I'm, just, is, I'm asking, is that yes. what you're asking? No. Okay. No, we, we haven't tried to purchase it, okay. purchase that land, no. We haven't, but there's, we've been on that street, like I said, for generations, and, um, but we haven't tried to purchase that particular property. Okay. No. And then I think it was Ms. Tara Warwick that spoke last. Yes. I completely missed your point. I'm sorry, I had to run to it. I had to run. Could you repeat what you said? I'm sorry. The whole thing? Yeah. Okay. Maybe you could summarize Ms. Warwick. Uh, it's pretty short. I just wanted to say that those of us who own houses in the neighborhood purchased our homes while the property in question has been zoned as residential suburban. And when making the decisions to purchase our homes, we did not have the opportunity to evaluate the area while it was zoned as commercial or the impact that would come from that, such as what had been mentioned tonight, increased noise, traffic, light pollution, et cetera. Um, furthermore, commercial neighborhood would be a reasonable alternative that was created specifically for circumstances like these. And if it's not considered here, the option of commercial neighborhood will be rendered a dust collector on the books. Thank you, Ms. Warwick. Anything else, Councilor Freeman? I think that's it. Now, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for staff. <clears throat> Thank you. Could you um, summarize for us what you feel are the significant differences between a commercial general, a commercial neighborhood designation beyond the 5,000 square foot building footprint. I think I'm, I'm just unclear of what would actually be significantly different in terms of what they could build on the site with CN rather than CG. So it's a good question and we didn't do a comparison of the two, but a, a quick synopsis um, as I was taking some notes um, drive through retail, daycare, gas stations, office uses are all permissible in both the CN and the CG zoning districts. There are a number of other uses like self-storage, um, vehicle repairs, golf courses that are uh, permissible in the CG and not in the CN. Um, the some of the major differences in terms of the district, in terms of the UDO standards, um, were already alluded to, but I'll just rehash them. Um, the CN limits the floor area of the building to 20,000 square feet, where there's no cap with the CG zoning district. Um, however, there is um, the limitation that in the CN district, which has already been mentioned, that if you go above that 5,000 square foot threshold, um, you would need to apply for the minor special use permit. Thank you. In your professional opinion, does the CN zoning decrease the, um, the chance of having a significant increase in noise or traffic or light pollution or the other things that the neighborhood is concerned about? The uses are the same, so there really isn't the restriction in terms of, the only way to restrict something in terms of prohibiting a drive-through or prohibiting um, uh, 
a use that may be considered a nuisance to the neighborhood would be doing it through a development plan. That's where you get to that level of specificity to prohibit specific types of uses or to limit the building square footage or to um, enhance the project boundary buffers above and beyond what the ordinance already allows. Um, all of the, uh, depending upon the zoning, um, adjacent zonings, they would still have to adhere to project boundary buffers for both the CG and the CN. But to really restrict specific types of uses, you would have to go to the development plan route. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The, uh, um, could, Ms. Sonia, can you talk to me about the previous history with the 2006 development plan or maybe Mr. Young? Do we have any kind of institutional history here on that that you could offer? We've heard from the uh, from the applicant and uh, also from the opponents on this. Yes, Pat Young with the planning department. Um, so a couple years before my time, I started in 2008, but looking at the file, I think Ms. Hall's characterization was correct. The planning commission voted rec to recommend denial. Uh, and then it was my understanding, and, and Ms. Hall, maybe one of the applicants can speak to this, that it was withdrawn before uh, the commission council members' final vote. Neil, do you know? Yeah. Plan amendment. Uh, so in, that, in that era. In, introduce yourself, please, Mr. Gosh. Sorry about that. Neil Gosh with the Morning Star Law Group. Uh, in that era, they were, they were not considering uh, plan amendments and rezonings as a joint item. So the plan amendment went to the council first, and it was not approved, and therefore the development plan rezoning was withdrawn because it was already inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, would not have been approved anyways. It was a moot point after the uh, plan amendment was denied. I can't fully attest, but that sounds very familiar. <laughs> I think that's what Ms. Hall was saying. This case was the catalyst to change how we look at rezonings that also have a uh, plan amendment associated with it. And why they're done together. Yeah, why they're done together as well. Okay. Um, and the... So, uh, do you agree with the, uh, the, the applicant that the developable portion of this land uh, would be given the, uh, the, the planned road improvements and, and so forth, the, the, the 1.8 or so acres that uh, the uh, applicant indicated would be developable? Did this seem like a plausible, did this seem plausible to you? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, it does. We certainly can't. We didn't look at that level of site design. Of course. The site plan's not in, but in terms of the um, requested right-of-way dedication and the required stream buffer, that would be approximate, I would say, in the range of 1.8 to 2 acres would be um, developable. And the... Um, okay, that's, that's, those are my questions, I believe. Thank you very much. Council members, any other questions for staff or for the applicant? I have one question. Mm -hmm. the specific topic. Sorry, Patrick Young. <laughs> Just specific to the plans coming forward in the next six months and around um, Council Member Caballero's um, question around if this would be something that would be alleviated. Is there any conversation around I guess, where, where are we in having more conversation around not just the specific commitments and development plan, like how are we at, how, how far along are we in having a conversation around specifically the issue where people don't have access and then they're developed over top of, so that there's some way to track What's happening? Because I recognize that this um, piece of land has been developed around and to the de detriment of this one family. 
their property values may have been impacted, but it's not uh, clear to me if we're if we're going to have a way to track how much of that is going to have an impact across the neighborhood, so to speak. And so I'm trying to figure out if there's anything coming forward in that realm. Well, Councilmember Freeman, one of the things we'll look at in the comprehensive plan update um, certainly is ensuring uh, that as we continue to develop infrastructure, uh, particularly roadways, that um, and as is currently the case, but with the focus in the comprehensive plan on um, equity and making sure there's not uh, environmental justice issues, undue impacts on um, communities of color and, and um, uh, low modern income communities. Um, and then with each individual case, if we think that uh, a land use pattern that's gonna cause adverse impacts on adjoiners, whether those are economic impacts or light noise uh, and other impacts like that, we'll, we make sure to disclose those to you fully. And as um, Ms. Sunyak said, we, we didn't see any substantial ones in this, in this instance. And I mean, I, I recognize that it's, it's one impact versus the other, and that there's no way to kind of measure what we have in front of us as a council without that type of information. And so it's harder to make the decision to support, you know, one property owner over the neighborhood in this instance than, the, than any other, so to speak. Well, that's certainly a fair comment. I think Ms. Sunyak did a very nice job of characterizing the difference between the um, commercial neighborhood and commercial general CN and CG districts. And so I, I think in the range of uses for CG or in your agenda package. So I appreciate your point, and we want to give I, you that additional I do want to say I, I, I do appreciate Ms. Sunyak's work, but the, uh, the tools are inadequate. Sure. So. Understood, and that's why we're going to work to get you improved tools here and, and as soon as possible. I know you will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions for staff or for the applicant or for uh, any of the opponents? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and matters back for the council. Uh, I will accept a motion or any other discussion at this point. Make a motion that we approve the plan amendment for. Hold on, I don't want to make anything else. Uh, to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map to commercial for the subject site? With the understanding that I will be voting against, yes. All right, there's a motion to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map to commercial for the subject site. Is there a second? Second. Oh. Madam Clerk, well, first of all, I should say, is there any dis further discussion? Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. <coughs> Sorry. The motion passes 6-1 with Councilmember Freeman voting no. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'll move we adopt the consistency statement. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Madam Clerk, we please open the vote. Close the vote. Motion passes 6-1 with Councilmember Freeman voting no. Thank you. Motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. Second. M Madam Clerk, we please open the vote. Close the vote. Motion passes 6-1 with Councilmember Freeman voting no. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move on to the next item, I do want to say to the neighbors, I think that we've, Thank you. Mr. Burwell and, and, and others, I do want to say we very much understand your concerns. This was a hard decision, as many of them are, uh, but uh, I think I speak for all of us in saying that we also understand the situation that Ms. Long was in and has been in for a long time. And we hope that as neighbors, you all can work this out. And uh, we also hope that, uh, that the development there will be a development that is conducive to the neighborhood and Ms. Long, Mr. Biker, we will be uh, uh, very observant about what development does go there. We can't control Absolutely. it. We know that. Absolutely. But we're Thank hoping you. that you all, as you look to sell this land, will keep this in, in consideration. I love this area. I love my neighbors. And that's all we've ever wanted to do. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, okay, we're now going to move to item 18, Economic Incentive Agreement with the City of Durham and Thompson Joinery, LLC. 
Uh, and uh, I see Mr. Dickey is here. Uh, and we will now hear from staff. Yeah. Um, uh, go ahead, Chris. I think we're okay. Mayor Shum, members of council, my name is Chris Dickey with the Office of Economic and Workforce De Development. Before you use an item to consider approval of a proposed agreement between the City of Durham and Thompson Journey LLC. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of history since this is the first neighborhood revival of Asian Center grant that has come before uh, this, this council. But uh, back in March 2006, uh, City Council approved the neighborhood assessment plan and plan to assess the economic strengths and weaknesses and opportunity and threats within targeted commercial areas. The assessment established a development for the revival of these areas. The process included outreach to local businesses and residents with many opportunities to participate in the process through leadership interviews and visionary sh charades. Furthermore, the, the city of Durham has designated five key targeted neighborhood commercial corridors that lead into downtown Durham that are in need of investment. The targeted neighborhood commercial areas were identified West Chapel Hill Street between South Buchanan Street and Maplewood Street, Fayetteville Street between Highway 147 and Homeland Avenue, East Main Street between Hood Street and Austin, Austin Avenue, uh, Andrew Driver, the, the intersection of Andrew Driver intersection, North Mangum Street between Corporation Street and, and, and Intersection. The thrust of the Neighborhood Revitalization Grant Incentive is to participate in public partnerships that redevelop commercial buildings that will have a substantial impact on physical, economic viability of affected neighborhoods, which will ultimately over time strengthen the city of Durham tax base in, in those particular areas. Um, probably for the past 10 years, Council, I can say there's probably been several major projects that I've worked with where we've made some substantial improvements. I've identified some of those in the impacted area there. Uh, Thompson Journey LLC is located at 400, uh, 400, 441, and 447 South Driver Street and 420, 422, and 420, 424 Salem Street consists of seven parcels applied for a neighborhood revitalization and center grant in the amount of $250,000 to support its proposed South Driver District Rehabilitation Project in the historic Andrew Driver Business D District in Northeast Central Durham within the targeted CDA, but outside the downtown development tier. The proposal is a $4.1 million economic development project, which includes purchasing 2.2 acres of the old Garland Millwork and Cabinetry Complex site. Consist consists of 31 square foot of manufacturing space and 12,000 square foot of blighted commercial office space totaling 43,000 square feet. Thompson Journey will be combining Garland and moving in this wood cabinetry and his historic home preservation business into this complex, creating Thompson Journey LLC. The project will completed will update, modernize mill equipment and renovate 31,000 square foot of manufacturing space and fully develop 6,000 square foot of historic street level storefronts, six shell spaces of 12,000 square foot of blighted commercial retail places. 26 jobs will be retained, each with paying livable wages and health benefits during the first year. An additional uh, 19 jobs are projected to be created over a five-year period. The OEWD partners at NC Works Career Center is currently working with Thompson Journey to provide training program, which entails the development of a customized training that will train current staff on new machinery that will cost approximately $1.7 million in capital investment. The Poles project will produce $3.8 million in private investments with 250,000 in city funding, reducing approximately a 15, a 15 to one ratio of private to public funding. The, polls, the proposed project, if funded, will continue to address an underutilized by the commercial building located along the Driver Street Commercial Quarter. St staff endorses this project, which will be a major step in the continue of the transformation of the Andrew Driver Commercial Quarter. Uh, whatever questions. Thank you very much, that. Mr. Dickey. Um, you all have heard from staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. Uh, we have two people who have signed up to speak on this item, uh, Matt Thompson and Ben Filippo. And I'm going to ask you all if you would please come here to the area to the right of the poem podium. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Have you, have you signed up to speak? Okay, could you please go to the front? clerk's desk and fill out the card. Can I ask you, are you an opponent or proponent? Proponent. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
All righty. Uh, I'm going to give each of you all three minutes. Uh, if you don't take it, that's okay, too. But you, you're certainly welcome to take it. Thank you. Thank you to everyone on council um, and the city representatives for being here. My name is Matt Thompson. Uh, I'm the founder and owner of Thompson Joinery. Um, I started my business in Durham uh, about five years ago uh, out of the back of my pickup truck. And I saw an opportunity to merge uh, my growing business with Garland uh, about a year ago. And so I approached the owner there, Mr. Harold Yates, who is 75 years old, as a way to carry on the legacy of Garland Woodcraft, which has been operating there since 1947. Um, for me, it represented a big step in my business, but it also represented an opportunity to invest in the storefronts um, and continue the growth of East Durham. Um, this, in particular, is a project that without the neighborhood improvement grant, I would not be able to execute. Um, so I appreciate your consideration towards that end. And I think that sort of bang for the buck of what the city is going to get out of this investment um, stacks up really well, both against other neighborhood improvement grants that have been granted in the past, and then also other projects that are going on in the area right now. So getting six storefronts activated um, and myself being sort of a, um, you know, sort of working up from the bottom, I want to continue to sort of provide opportunities for other businesses to get a foothold um, that may not have that opportunity. Uh, in addition, on my business side, moving more into the commercial realm, whereas previously I had done a lot of um, projects in downtown Durham on my own, but we'd also mainly been focused residential, being able to move into the commercial realm, carry on Garland's ability to replicate moldings, uh, do custom architectural millwork, I think that's an important service to the community. Um, Garland is currently executing a lot of the millwork package for the self-help project that's right up the street, which was also a neighborhood improvement grant. Um, so they're working on the storefronts that are going to be um, activated from the self-help project. Um, those are the kind of projects that Garland has been great at, and they're the kinds of things that I was involved in. So it, it's sort of the right fit. Um, my attitude towards running the business is that it'll give me the bandwidth to continue to hire and train people to protect the trade and the craft while also providing health insurance, retirement benefits, and a living wage. Um, my business has been a member of the Durham Living Wage, but for me, it's, it's really about um, protecting the craft and, and giving people the opportunity to work um, in, in a field where they feel like what they're doing matters and they can actually provide for their families. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Filippo. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Temp Johnson and members of the council, Ben Filippo, 2002 East Main Street. Um, Matt is a really humble guy. Um, the undertaking of Garland Woodcraft, a multi-acre woodworking site, uh, established in 1947, um, and then aggregated of many other sites that were various other stores over time and became just a giant Garland site, um, is a huge one and a necessary one. Um, as many of you know, um, we are losing rapidly sort of an inner ring of uh, working class light industrial jobs in Durham. Um, Bud Piper Roofing will soon become a high tech tech office of some kind. Um, art sign company on South Goley in North, Northeast Central Durham. Um, the man is retiring and it will soon become, who knows, condos or something. Um, and so, you know, the simple reality is that um, good wage jobs in light industrial manufacturing are slipping away from us very, very fast. And um, I think that we should celebrate um, you know, not only the legacy of Garland Woodcraft that's been discussed a little bit here, uh, founded by a man um, with an incredible name, Eliza Bunyan Stone, um, who went by AB for a good reason. Um, you know, not only that, but, you know, really um, just the idea of, um, as Matt hinted towards, um, creating a new generation of woodworkers and craft, craftsmen. Um, in my previous 
life as director of preservation Durham, this was something that um, I was really, really concerned about is that we have a great number of really elaborate historic renovations happening here in Durham right now, and we are not training anyone to do any of that work ever. Um, that is a really, really big oversight. Um, we have a huge opportunity with, you know, again, this, this 15 to 1 public-private investment here um, to kickstart, hopefully, uh, you know, a whole series of different collaborations, um, you know, beyond, um, you know, obviously Matt's intention um, of creating new jobs there um, and the NC Works collaboration, you know, potentially down the road, seeing things um, like collaborations with Durham Tech around the corner. Um, but, but there's a huge need for this talent pool um, in Durham, and we should have it in Durham um, and continue the legacy of Garland. Um, and, and again, I think that um, we see, I see this as a neighbor and, and as an adjacent business owner at East Durham Bake Shop, um, a huge opportunity um, to create more, um, you know, well-paying, good jobs um, that do not require a overly expensive liberal arts education. Um, so I, I really uh, hope that you guys strongly consider um, this uh, necessary um, grant for uh, a really wonderful person who um, is very humble and speaks modestly about uh, this undertaking that they are moving forward with. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Filippo. You just, you just knocked half of our resumes up here. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I can do that great woodworking, though, so, you know. <laughs> right. um, sir, I'm sorry that I cannot read your handwriting. I think <laughs> your, your name might be Mr. Couturel. Couturel. Pretty good. You right, got that right. good. Welcome. You have three minutes. Tell us your name and address, please. Thank you. My name is Will Couturel. I live on 1020 West Murray Avenue. I was uh, born in Vung Dao, Vietnam in 1970. In 1975, I came to America and grew up in Somerset County, New Jersey. 2001, I found myself, I came here with my young wife and uh, young daughter to Durham. And uh, we live, we've been living here for the past 17 years. And I've enjoyed watching the uh, revitalization of Durham um, for the past 17 years. And uh, today, I'm proud to call myself a homeowning Durhamite. Now, for the past 13 years, I've been working with uh, Hardwood Designs, a uh, small commercial mill workshop in Hillsborough County. And uh, we've done a lot of projects. I engineered, I was their engineering manager. And I engineered a lot of projects in the Raleigh-Durham, Chapel Hill area. And I'm sure you're only concerned about the ones in the Durham area. We did a lot of work for, the, um, for Duke the Fuquay School of Business I engineered, I helped engineered the uh, School of Nursing, um, the new medical suites. And just recently, about two months ago, I was released from Hardwood Designs. And uh, I had to basically dust off my resume and start going through the process of looking for new employment. Luckily, I ran into Matt about a week after I got uh, released. And about uh, after a couple interviews, two weeks later, I found myself uh, with a proud, proud to be his uh, new engineering manager. And uh, he read me in on his uh, ideas and dreams that he has for this area. And after um, he shared that with me, I was, I'm ecstatic to have this opportunity to uh, not only now watch the revitalization of Durham, but an opportunity to maybe participate in the revitalization at least for the South Driver Street area. So um, I hope that this will go through and I will get the opportunity to work with you through Matt to uh, help revitalize Durham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katoro. Appreciate your remarks. Is there anyone else who has not been heard on this item who would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? All righty. Um, <laughs> If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council uh, for any uh, discussion uh, or a motion. Any questions for staff, any discussion? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for Mr. Thompson. Hey, could you tell us a little bit about the demographics of your workforce with regard to race and gender? Sure. Um, 
we have um, cur currently in my current organization, Thompson Joinery, I have uh, two Hispanic uh, people that work with me, um, two women, um, Will, the Vietnamese and African American sector covered, um, <laughs> and um, a number of bearded and tattooed white guys to go with. So we have a mix of people. Uh, the Garland move um, is definitely a bunch of guys that have worked there since high school. <laughs> and we're gonna figure out how to sort of move forward from there, so. Thank you, so in East Durham, um, as you know, as it has been a um, majority, minority neighborhood for a long time. Do you have plans to uh, work with more people from the community with regard to your business expansion? Yeah, and I'm totally open to that possibility, especially, you know, there's a distinction in what we do of very high skill work balanced against people who are coming into more of an apprentice mindset as, as an attempt to build careers. Um, and I am happy to commit myself to working with people in the neighborhood to develop those um, possibilities going forward. Uh, we went to the PAC One meeting um, a couple weeks ago and um, one of the people there introduced me to someone. You know, I, I hope to continue to develop those relationships going forward. That'd be great, thank you. Um, and could you, you said that you, you pay living wage and provide health insurance. What's the starting wage? My lowest employees? paid employee makes sixteen fifty an hour. Great, thank you so much. Council Member Freeman. Thank you. I, um, I appreciate what you're trying to do in East Durham. And as a resident in East Durham, I am not recusing myself because I have no financial gain, but. <laughs> I think it's important to note that as a resident there, I, I acknowledge that there's a tension between the gentrification that's occurring and trying to revitalize very intentionally and the work that you're trying to do right now as far as making sure that you're making the community, you know, or navigating the community terrain and making sure you're meeting people in the community and ready to work with people in the community is a good part of that. And I really want to appreciate how uh, the Office of Workforce and Economic Development has been intentional about that work for years. And in this corridor specifically, it is up to us as the council. I mean, we just took that vote on participatory budgeting and making sure that we're surrounding um, projects like this with support because it's not going to happen um, within the budget, so to speak. It's actually gonna be us making those, those conversations and relationships across the board with businesses like, I'm sorry, Thompson? Joiner. Joiner. And others out there that are interested in doing um, projects like this. I mean, Mr. Joiner is, is being rather humble in this. I think this project's full cost is about what? Four and some million. Four. Point something one, one million dollars. Four point, point one million it gets being. A little, it gets a little bigger all the time. Say it again. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> just say it one more time. I'm, I've missed it. Four point one million dollars. Four point one million dollars for a. How much was the grant? It's two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay. I just want to make sure that that is said because it's it's something that we don't highlight, and I know you don't want to, but it's important that we make sure we say it and that we do this work on the economic development side and then also on the housing side to make sure that folks are being married with work in and housing so that we're not having this displacement that we have that we have right now in east durham so thank you thank you very much council member mayor pro tem thank you i'm sorry i forgot one question could you describe um your practices with regard to hiring people who have a criminal background mm -hmm. um so I, to be honest, I have been the HR department, um, which means generally speaking, so long as I'm okay with them, it's fine. Um, actually, it's not really germane, but you know, some of my guys have had issues. But uh, going forward, we're also going to be working with NC Works on you know sort of developing the path towards um, careers, and so. 
I, I don't know how to answer that so concretely at this point. But you you are open to hiring people with criminal records. Great, thank you. Any other questions, Councilmember Caballero? Um, so reading your letter made me laugh. My husband was a philosophy and religions major and dropped out of college and then was a carpenter for a while until he blew out his back and then went back to architecture school. <laughs> so I appreciate your story. Um, and I just want to say that these kinds of jobs are so important, uh, especially noted when you say the cost of a college degree and we need to be able to create pathways for people. Uh, and the, the fact that you are thinking around hiring um, people of color, especially in the neighborhood that you're in, people who were formerly incarcerated or were just as involved is also something I think is crucially important and also very much developing a relationship with Durham Tech. Uh, I can't say how important these jobs are for our future. Uh, we're not, we're not gonna create enough jobs uh, for our future students if we don't start thinking out of the box and start doing things like that. So thank you. More comments or questions? One more if no one else. Additionally, I just want to, I just feel like if I, if I don't say it, it feels like it's, it's un, the burden of recognizing that this type of project can only happen as we work together. Understanding like when I talk about racial equity, it is not to, to the detriment of white people or people that are not of color. It is actually how we figure out ways in which to partner to figure out how it benefits us all. And so I just want to be clear in, in making that statement because I don't always say that, but it is kind of a kind of a, a given for me. So, thank you, Mr. Thompson. I noticed in in your original letter, um, and maybe Chris can help on this too. I believe that the first request was five hundred thousand dollars for the uh, for our uh, grant, and now it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And I think in the letter it said. Uh, we we would need five hundred thousand dollars and able to be doing be able to do the outfit that we would like to do for the retail spaces. And uh, you talked earlier about the fact that that the this what this grant will enable you to do is do the outfit for those retail spaces. Am I right? Uh, so that you'll be able to uh, include some local businesses in there uh, and give them an opportunity to have those storefronts, which is awesome. Uh, which is something we haven't focused on. Uh, I think that you're right. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we've been right to focus on the jobs that you'll be providing, the good paying jobs and the high skills, and, and it's a tremendous opportunity for people uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, but uh, in terms of the actual grant and the request for the upfit, could you or maybe Chris, either one, talk about the, the amount and why this is the amount and uh, why it's different from your initial request? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I've been talking with Matt for quite a few months when this project first came to us, and you are correct, his original quest was for a half a million dollars. Um, currently, in our neighborhood revitalization fund, we have $250,000 that's allocated for this particular year that we have in our particular fiscal budget. Uh, I sat down with Matt and basically told him, how could we make this work within your budget? And we sat down and, and we talked, and if you see in the write-up, normally, originally it was 40, there's 43,000 square foot space and 31,000 is for the manufacturing side. Our focus really was on the commercial development of the commercial retail side where there's an upstairs and there's a downstairs. Upstairs is 6,000 square foot. Upstairs, downstairs is 12,000 square foot. So strategically what we said was that, what can we do? Can we do the bottom space? I know there's a lot of damage to the building, but can we do the bottom space with $250,000? He went back and he crunched his numbers and basically said, I can. And then if you look into the application, he did sort of a phase two, phase three. I, th I think you may want to elaborate on that, about the phases down yeah. the road. It's not incorporated in, in this. This 250 is going to do the renovation of the manufacturing facilities as well as the bottom where we're going to activate six spaces down there. And then down the road, when he gets some additional dollars, he's going to go okay. back and explore the 6,000 square foot. Okay, on top of that. Well, that's very helpful. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, and then uh, let me just make sure I didn't have any other questions on that. Uh, yes, I think that's okay. Uh, and I just want to emphasize uh, what uh, my colleagues have talked about, which is the seriousness with which we take uh, the 
uh, employment of people from the neighborhood, and especially diversifying the workforce, uh, racially diversifying the workforce. And I know you'll pay attention to that, uh, but I want to just uh, put a marker on it in terms of our concerns. Uh, this grant uh, comes with that understanding, and uh, so I hope you'll be paying a lot of attention to it. Great. All right, uh, council members, any more questions or comments? If not, do I hear a motion that, uh, uh, that, uh, that I've closed the public hearing, have I not? Yes, I have. Okay, can I have a motion that we uh, authorize the city manager to execute an ex economic development incentive agreement with Thompson Joinery? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Great. Mr. Thompson, this is very exciting uh, for our city, uh, as well as I know it's exciting for you. And so best of luck to you, and we all look forward to coming over there and uh, maybe cutting a ribbon or something. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, very much. Um, and now we'll move to item 19, public hearing for confirmation of assessment role for sidewalk on Hardwick Drive. Mr. Joyner, we'll hear from staff. Good evening, Mayor Shull, members of council. I'm Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Item 19 is to conduct a public hearing to receive comments on the confirmation of the assessment role for sidewalk on a portion of Hardwick Drive and to adopt a resolution confirming the sidewalk assessment role. Staff has received no objections to the assessment. I'll be happy to answer any questions that council may have. Thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, well, you've heard from staff. I'll declare this public hearing open. Uh, first of all, are there any questions from staff or members of council? I have a couple questions, Robert. One person is paying all of this assessment? That is correct. And is paying at actual cost, is that right? That is correct. And is paying interest of 8.25%? 8 point, did I get that right? I believe that is correct, yes, sir. And this is done to provide a safe place for kids to catch the bus? That is correct. Or were there other reasons? Uh, that is the primary one that I'm aware of, uh, walkability also for um, folks in and of the area. I believe that that person is also receiving some additional help from the HOA. Okay, is the person present? Is the resident president present who is uh, being assessed? Um, so, um, okay, so there, you think they're being, uh, uh, the HOA is helping for the pay, with the payment of this. I believe that is correct. Let me just say, if not, I would think this would have been an exceptionally good Samaritan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so I was pleased to read that and wanted to give the person their due recognition. Uh, and, uh, but I'm sorry they're not here and glad to hear that the HOA is, is also going to be contributing. Thank you. Any other questions? They're watching at home. Right. If you're watching at home and you are that person, thank you. Um, any other questions? Anyone want to speak on this item? No one has signed up to speak. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter is back before the council. Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we um, approve the item. Second. It's been moved and approved, uh, moved and second that we conduct, that we adopt a resolution confirming the sidewalk assessment for Hardwick Drive. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Joyner. And now we will move to item 20, public hearing to consider adopting a resolution rescinding a previously ordered water main to serve portions of Bandock Drive and Ron Delay Drive. Good evening, Mayor Shull and members of council. I'm Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Item 20 is to hold a public hearing to consider adopting a resolution rescinding a previously ordered water main to serve portions of Bandock, Ron Delay Drive, Staff recommends that council conduct a public hearing to receive the comments and adopt a resolution rescinding this previously ordered petition improvement. I'll be happy to answer any questions council may have. Thank you very much. You've heard the report from staff, and now I'm going to declare this public hearing open. First of all, are there any questions for staff by members of the council? No. <coughs> any questions? I have a question. Um, how many of the parcels in question are serviced by Aqua? There will be a total of 43 lots served. By uh, Aqua? Currently. <coughs> Why 
We'll get to you, sir. So for Van Docht and Rondelay? Yes, sir. Yeah, there'll be a total of 43 lots, is my understanding. How, many are, how the, many are currently served by Aqua? Th this gentleman says 28. It says 27 in the... Mm -hmm. You're getting some help from Marvin. Yeah, it's this one. Uh, I'm sorry, 27 existing residences and 16 vacant lots. Are served by Aqua. Uh, I, I think we do not have an accurate count uh, Aqua Utilities has not, would not work with us to provide us uh, I read that. what customers are connected. Okay, I read that. Yeah, all right. Have homeowners with wells contacted Aqua for water service, to your knowledge? Uh, I do not know. Aqua, again, would not confirm any information for us. Is this contiguous to the city limits? It is. Okay. It's adjacent to the uh, Ravenstone. Uh, subdivision. It right. actually ties into it. They'll be part of the water connection will connect to Ravenstone. Okay, those are my questions for now. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one person who signed up to speak on this matter. Uh, that is Mr. Bruce Harris. Uh, is there anyone else besides Mr. Harris who is present tonight who would like to speak on this item? Anyone else beside Mr. Harris? Welcome, Mr. Harris. You have three minutes, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and the rest of the council, and um, city manager as well. Uh, I've lived on Van Dock Drive now for 47 years. It was probably the first subdivision on East Durham. Uh, if you call it a subdivision, it was not done by one manufacturer, but individual uh, development for individual lots, therefore the discrepancy on the number of lots. Some of those lots are two and three lots that have had one house on them. So they're now 27, 28. A couple of them are actually over on Olive Branch. Uh, we petitioned originally for this back in 2009, 2010. It came before the council and they approved uh, that in, in uh, June of 2010. We did that because we had had a single water system that was installed for that because all of the wells, not all, many of the wells were failing in that area. So they had to put that in in order to be able to develop the lots for this subdivision. <clears throat> the um, survey is actually started by the uh, city in 2011 uh, to actually look for the hookups where they're going to have to be on that. Uh, Aqua expressed in interest in this water system on, in uh, 2012, and they filed in 2013 to take over the system. Aqua has been good, responsible for the water system. They've put in some improvements for filtering. They haven't put in anything for the water distribution system. We've had several different breaks on that. They've come out and repaired it, but. It's on an individual basis, and they're going to keep doing that. My own supply to my meter had to be replaced because a 5 eighths or 3 quarter inch pipe was down to the size of a pencil for the water to be able to come through through all the deposits because of the swell system that, that uh, contains a lot of those things. Um, so the water system, per se, we aren't having problems with. But we don't have any fire connections on this. It's not capacity to do any pumping. Uh, I gave uh, pictures of a house fire that we had in uh, August of this last year. It had to bring a tank in to do it, tankers in to do that. We were 500 feet or less from the hydrant that is up at the corner on Ravenstone and, and Hillview. Uh, but they still had to pump water in because they couldn't get the water from the city to, to do that, even though it was that close on it. So the major concern I have is that we may have water system that's adequate expensive but adequate, uh, but we don't have any fire protection for these houses, these 27 families on, on Van Dock as, as well, uh, other than tankers, and by the time the city gets, uh, the people get there, it's maybe too late. Plus now, 
were part of the Bethesda Fire District. They're now part of the City Fire District. They don't have anything to hook up to on our on the street. So the fire protection is, is, is certainly a major concern that if we rescind this type of thing, we're not going to have it for again, and the next house can be as bad as, as what uh, you see there. Um, so I thank you for your considerations, and I think even though it's going to be maybe cost-effective because it's not, no longer 2010 rates that, that we agreed with the unanimous uh, participation of the people on our street and the city, but we still need the fire protection. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Yes, sir. Let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. You all are contiguous to the city. Yes, sir. Have you ever asked for annexation? No, at the time we, we filed for this, we got the reading from the uh, city that because it was only a water supply line and not a water and sewer line that we wouldn't, that they didn't, they weren't interested in bringing us into the, into the city as per se that, um, because that's going to be a, a problem. We're all in septic systems there. They're all approaching 50 years old. It's about time we're going to start having failures in that. Um, so that may be something that we have to look at. Uh, further on down isn't getting septic systems on there, but right now, certainly our, our major concern is the water system and, uh, and having the fire protection that we need for our community, especially since the water supply lines are at the top of the hill and at the bottom of the hill. It's just running down one street. It's I not understand. a big construction. So I wonder if I could hear from staff about this question about the sewer lines and the annexation. Yes, sir. So typically, uh, staff uh, does not recommend, if, if both utilities are not available, staff generally does not recommend in favor of annexation. And the reason for that is if only one utility is present, then essentially you would have the right of petition if you annex, and the city could be on the hook for a lot of money to provide a utility in that area where none exists. Okay. Unlike the what we're on the hook for to pay if the Water improvements go forward. Sorry, say that again, sir. Not unlike the the on the hook that we're on if the improvements go forward. Yes, that is correct. So explain that to me then. So in the uh, situation of whether they annex, um, in this particular instance. Uh, the city is actually constructing a regional pump station that will actually take the Ravenstone pump station offline. And when that is in place, there would be an outfall relatively close to serve this entire uh, community within reason. I haven't done an engineering study of all of the uh, ins and outs of how that would serve by a gravity sewer, um, but that's about four and a half years, uh, four years approximately out for construction completion. Well, I guess what I'm getting to, Mr. Harris, I don't know if I'm right, but I'm trying to figure it out, is that the, the, um, you all are not paying city taxes. That's correct, sir, or county. Yes. And you've come to the city for, in this case, $559,000 we're at at this point uh, of city money uh, to uh, uh, to provide this water service. And uh, I, I don't know the number. We haven't got that yeah, feedback. I'm not blaming you. I, yeah. I'm not saying it's a problem. Well, you know, you did what you did. You applied. I'm just trying to figure out what the best thing for the city yeah. is. Well, the, the original quote that we had when we did this in, in 2011, when it came, was voted on by the council beforehand, yeah, I'm was twenty-three dollars and fifty cents of, of frontage foot to put in the, the line. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what that number is now, yeah. but my assumption is that it's probably more than that in, in, the, in the current. And I'm just wondering if this is, is is okay. We rescind this now, and then if we need it at a later time, so we can get you know a different one than what was agreed upon eight years ago. Nine. Right. And, so and that's, that seems. It seems like a, a, a justification for trying to relieve this uh, from the agreement that we originally had, which, by the way, was unanimous, I think, possible exception of one person of the whole 
street that filed that petition. Okay. I understand. I understand. Um, but it, so again, going back to the sewer, Mr. Joyner, there's a there. You're saying there's a pump station that is going to be built in Ravenstone or a new pump station. So there exists a pump station in Ravenstone uh -huh. uh, that is actually upstream of this property. Okay. In the reach. So it would be difficult for that existing station to serve this property. The regional station, which will be much further uh, to the east downstream, actually will also construct an outfall that will be take that Ravenstone pump station offline and also the bright leaf at the park station. Okay. And so when the both of those pump stations are taken offline, uh, this there would be a gravity sewer to extend up into the sewer reach to serve, I believe, most of these houses. Okay, and we won't know that for a few years. Yes, sir. You ping that. Any any other questions or comments from other members of the council? Whether you're ready for an action. Any other comments or questions? I guess I'm just, you know, I feel like. Here we have a, a neighborhood that's contiguous to the city. Uh, we've got sewer coming there. They have water for now. I am very, you know, I, I am very sympathetic to what you had to say about the fire situation for sure. Um, but it seems like we have a possible reasonable annexation solution in the next few years and uh, that might be uh, a lot cheaper than this for us. So I don't know, do you have any comments on that, Mr. Joyner? That is very likely true, sir. That's very likely true. I'm sorry, the, the water system, the water line is gonna be cheaper in the future? It will be offset by the fact that potentially you would be paying city taxes if you annex, I believe, is the, the point that's trying to be made, sir. Yeah. Sure. But, uh... Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions, council members? All right. Um, Mr. Harris, thank you very much. Appreciate your being here. Um, Any other, without any other questions or comments, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we're being asked to adopt a resolution rescinding the previously ordered water main improvement on Van Dyke Drive. I'll move that we um, adopt a resolution rescinding the, the Second. order. Second. Any more discussion? <coughs> if not, uh, could you please, oh, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. Motion to rescind passes four to three with Council Member Middleton voting no, Council Member Freeman and Council Member Reese voting no. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Harris, we have rescinded the resolution, the previously ordered water main improvement. Um, I know this was not the outcome that you wanted. Uh, and I think that uh, Appreciate your being here, and uh, it would be good to uh, have a discussion with our Public Works Department about some next steps given uh, the uh, future, uh, the future uh, sewer outfall and so forth. So thank you very much. All righty, we're now moving to item 21, public hearing to consider adopting resolution rescinding a previously ordered water main to serve portions of Olive Branch Road and Bookman Street. Mr. Joyner. Good evening, Mayor Shull, members of council. I'm Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Item 21 is to hold a public hearing to consider adopting a resolution rescinding a previously ordered water main to serve a portion or portions of Olive Branch and Bookman Street. Staff has received a letter from Olive Branch Baptist Church stating that its existing well is failing and is not meeting the church's current needs. Church feels it would be best served by connecting to city water. Staff recommends that council conduct a public hearing to receive additional comments and adopt a resolution rescinding this previously ordered petition improvement. Be happy to answer any questions city council may have. Thank you very much. Uh, 
You've heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions from members of the council for staff. If there are no questions at this time, we do have one speaker signed up to speak, Mr. Todd Wright. Is Mr. Wright here? And I'll also ask, is there anyone else here at this time who would like to speak on this item? Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Welcome, Mr. Wright. Uh, please give us your name and address, and, and you have three minutes. We're glad to see you. Mayor Shul and Mayor Pro Tem Johnson and City Council members, my name is Todd Wright. I live at 116 Brereton Drive, Raleigh. I'm here to represent Olive Branch Baptist Church, which is located at 123 Olive Branch Road. I'm here with our pastor, Tim Wheeler. If you wonder why I'm speaking instead of him, I was about two minutes late to our pastor advisory committee, and <laughs> they selected me to do the speaking. We are here to request that you not rescind the utility order that was approved in 2010 to install a water line to serve the Olive Branch and uh, Bookman Street area. Uh, as stated, we are uh, dealing with a failing water system. Our, our well does not meet our current needs, um, and we are pursuing what we consider to be a temporary fix, but we believe that long-term we would be best served by hooking up to city water. Um, in accordance to the uh, Notice that was sent out dated April 23rd that you're con you have three options you're considering. We support option one, which is to continue with the design and construction of the water main. <coughs> Our advisory committee talked about ways that we could partner with the city. Uh, we're certainly willing to be annexed, which we realize that may not provide any tax revenue, but we also um, are willing to uh, dedicate right away. Uh, we have a lot of road frontage on 98 Highway and Olive Branch Road, and we suspect that down the road there will be some plans to widen those roads, so we could certainly partner in that area. But the real issue is that, you know, we have a failing water system that we're trying to deal with. I am aware that you all have uh, uh, had four other issues like this up for rescinding it. You, voted to not rescind them. Of course, the one before this, you went ahead and approved that. So tonight there's been a theme of equity about what you desire in your city. And I'm not sure that last vote, I saw that. But I hope you will take a different approach on this vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Council members, uh, you have heard the, uh, the gentleman, and now we are uh, I'm going to throw it open for uh, questions and comments by members of the council. Mr. Joyner, I'll ask you. Uh, this is also contiguous to the city? This is contiguous to the previous project uh, and by virtue of that, is close to the city limits, but not directly connected. Not contiguous. Okay. Council members, questions, comments? All righty. I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter's back before the council. Do I hear a motion? Move to adopt a resolution. Rescinding the previous order. Water main improvement on all branch road. From Thank Lake you. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the resolution rescinding the previous order. Water main improvement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion to rescind passes with Council Members Middleton, Freeman, and Reese voting no. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, appreciate it a lot. All righty. There being no more business to come before this council, I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned, 1041.